Okay. I think it's a good time to get started uh, after the ceremonial technical difficulties that every event must endure. Uh, welcome everybody to QG Jam. Um, I am Kaylin, my pronouns are they, them, or he, him. I am one of your organizers. Uh, Jess and Chuck, you are welcome to introduce yourselves. Uh, and I'm Jess Marcotte, uh, also they, them pronouns, uh, and also one of your QGCon co-organizers who is extremely excited uh, for the amazing people uh, that are going to be speaking with us today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So uh, yeah, welcome, welcome to QG Jam. Uh, this jam uh, is made possible uh, thanks to our sponsor, uh, Clever Endeavor, uh, who is helping us, uh, you know, pay people honoraria because we believe in paying people whenever possible for the work that they're doing. Uh, so as we meet today for this symposium uh, and we jam across this week. Many of us uh, will be connecting from places across the globe that have long histories and current ongoing realities uh, of colonial violence. Indigenous people across the world are still struggling to protect themselves and their lands. Uh, many have no access to clean water, uh, healthcare, or are living through ongoing traumas of colonial violence and genocide. I myself am both Mi'kmaq uh, and have European settler heritage. Uh, I'm joining from Montreal uh, or Jojage, uh, which is a traditional gathering place for many First Nations built by many nations. The Ganyan Gahaga have long been the custodians and protectors of these lands. Uh, as for you, maybe you're in Australia where a historic referendum for constitutional change to help recognize indigenous people has just failed to pass. Or perhaps like me, uh, like those of, those of us uh, in Canada and the US, uh, you're in a place where your government is openly lauding and supporting uh, an act of genocide. Um, so we acknowledge these facts, but it's important to move beyond acknowledgement. We cannot look the other way when it comes to oppression. So we ask that you take the time to consider what concrete actions you can take to support indigenous sovereignty where you live and to call out and act against colonial violence and genocide. Thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna pause for a minute here. So uh, what is QGCon? Uh, why are we here? What do we do? Uh, QGCon is the Queerness and Games Conference. Uh, it's an event for game developers and scholars uh, at the intersection of LGBTQ issues and games uh, and many other intersections. Uh, we've been active since 2013. Uh, we started out as a, a small conference uh, in Berkeley, California. Uh, before moving uh, to Los Angeles uh, and then later to Montreal. Uh, in 2022, we incorporated as a nonprofit org uh, in Canada called the QGCon Collective. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm actually super excited uh, that some of, uh, one of the QGCon uh, co founders from 2013 uh, is also one of our speakers today. Uh, so, so QGCon uh, has been active. Uh, in, in this space for, for a decade now, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, this, this QG Jam uh, is, is our latest event uh, after lying fallow for a while uh, and working to incorporate uh, a legal structure that would help us continue to support our work. Yeah, um, and I thought I would talk a little bit on that note about what QG Jam is. Uh, and why we're so excited about running a jam as a kind of queer organization that's been active for this long. Uh, so QG Jam is a rad virtual game jam for members of our community. Um, it is for, but not exclusively for, people who identify as on the LGBTQ plus spectrum. Um, 
it is an experiment in anti-capitalist and queer game making, and it's an event to bring together game creators and scholars. So we want this to be a space, I think, uh, that pushes back against some of the um, toxic and problematic norms in game jams, um, and a place to do some maybe uh, serious experimental thinking about about what game jams can be and how we can queer the idea of a game jam. So, so I've been to a lot of game jams. Uh, I there there are things that I like a lot about the fact that they're like self-contained, uh, like little bubbles of creativity, uh, where I'm very privileged to be able to put everything aside. Uh, but for many people, uh, and for me too, like as I as I mature, uh, they can be pretty exhausting. Uh, you know, they they demand uh, a lot of people, and they require you to be able to put everything aside. Uh, and I think that that formula doesn't work for a lot of people uh, and 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 can cause like harm to our bodies, uh, to ourselves. Uh, and so that's one reason I'm really excited that uh, QG Jam is happening over the course of a week for the making uh, and then a week to get to enjoy the, the games that we all make together. Uh, and I'm also happy to see that that sort of Seems seems to be the trend in some other larger jams too, like uh, you know, um, global game jam running over the course of a week uh, for the first time uh, this this last year, for example. Yeah, I think people are starting to realize that practices like expecting people to work for twelve to fourteen hours per day, uh, jamming only on the weekends, and uh, creating a kind of competitive atmosphere for jams in which people's games are rated and judged against each other, uh, create really difficult and exclusive exclusionary conditions, right? You can't participate in a lot of game jams if, uh, if you um, engage in religious practices in the weekend. You can't do it if you are a parent um, or if you have like a second or third job or if you, you, know, you work at a job that is inflexible in terms of time. Um, it makes it hard for people who are excited to make their first game or to experiment, uh, who aren't interested in participating in competitive structures of game making, um, to just have, it makes them hard, harder for them to just have fun. So uh, I think a big motivation for us has been to think about how we can structurally change game jams to disincentivize these kinds of toxic norms that I think a lot of us default to when we go to a game jam. I know that mm -hmm. for me, I've gone to a lot of game jams and sort of expected to work for long, long days or work all day. Uh, and so sort of rethinking those kinds of assumptions we make is important well, think, to us. I think it also drastically shapes the kinds of games that get made at game jams. Like, yeah, you'll, you'll see some experimentation or like some alt control work or that sort of stuff. But that seems to be, you know, despite the way that many game jams are run, not because of. So, you know, um, I think that uh, traditional, you know, 48 hour game, uh, game jam structure encourages people to speed through, you know, like yeah. pre-production steps, for example. It's like, you know, latch on to the first idea that, uh, that y'all come up with and then, you know, make something real fast. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's no time to, to like, think or consider about like different like alternative possibilities or or that sort of stuff. Uh, and I think that, you know, again, that um, that competitive nature, uh, you know, game jams with prizes or like, you know, even sometimes superlatives um, wind up, yeah, like encouraging people to make games that look like other games that they may have seen that are successful. Uh, yeah. You know, as we know, the industry is like very slow to change and very slow to turn. Uh, and is is like pretty risk averse uh, on the whole, and I think that like you know we risk emulating those structures when we ask people to like work fast and hard uh, without you know giving themselves like time to process and think uh, for for sure. Yeah, something that's been really interesting about and one of my favorite things about QGCon in its ten year existence has been the discussion of alternative possible game mechanics. So. Um, if you're not familiar, a lot of our speakers in previous years have talked about what queer game mechanics could look like or what queerness can look like in games beyond sort of representing queer characters. 
Um, and one of the unfortunate realities of the game development pipeline is that it is very hard to make games that aren't within traditional genres simply because uh, there are tools and uh, assets and packs that exist to make games in existing genres that aren't there to make games that don't exist yet or types of games that don't exist yet. So giving people more time and creating a more explicit experimental space is also about helping people be able to think about those kinds of experimental mechanics instead of having to sort of structurally default to uh, genres that are familiar to them and types of game mechanics and such. Should we talk about some principles? Yes, let's talk about the principles. Um, so we uh, at we have we've developed four sort of core principles to the jam that I need to pull up so that I can describe them. Um, we the first thing we did when we started planning out this jam was to think about what kinds of principles we wanted to jam on. I think a lot of us were reluctant to run just another game jam for the reasons that that we just described. Um, and uh, so we landed on these four. The first one, the the sort of top priority for us is that self-care comes first. At the end of QG Jam, we don't want participants to be burnt out, stressed out, and sleep deprived. This is not a crunch-based exercise. You don't need to finish your game, and there are no gold stars for polish. You should participate at whatever level is sustainable and energizing for you. That might include stepping away sometimes, contributing for only 30 minutes each day, or contributing only during set blocks of time that work for your schedule. The same is true for all of your teammates. You should discuss how much each time each member of your group is willing to enable to invest um, in terms of time and plan accordingly. We believe that a supportive environment and reasonable goals provide the best conditions for the creation of meaningful art and interesting ideas. Our second principle is to make something weird. The idea of this jam is to work with concepts from the round tables from these panels that might that you might be encountering for the first time or that you might never have otherwise thought to make a game about. We care more about ideas and execution. This is your chance to push the limits of games and express something new. Don't worry if it's uh, any good or not. Don't feel like you only have to work with tools or engines you're comfortable with. And don't be afraid to switch up roles. If you usually think of yourself as a programmer, why not try making art assets or vice versa? Let things get weird. This is the queerness in Games Jam. So we want this to be a space where it feels safe to play, experiment, and come up with game concepts that might not have a place anywhere else. Even if you end up with something that doesn't work or something you'll never return to after the jam, that's perfectly fine. And to be honest, it's actually really cool from our perspective. Our third principle is to communicate your needs and goals. Uh, communicating with your teammates is one of the best things you can do to make sure that you all have a positive jam experience. And that starts with being clear about your personal goals for the jam and how that fits in with the group. Maybe you want to learn a new tool, program your first game, or work on your game art skills. Maybe you'd like to make a prototype to revisit later or to test out what it feels like to work with a specific group of people. Maybe you just want to make some new friends. Whatever your goals are, making them explicit to each other can help you to navigate decisions together during the jam and better understand where each of you com is coming from. And I think it can also um, push back against this idea that by default, everybody has to be here to advance themselves professionally and to make something polished and kind of like win the competition or whatever. Communicating throughout the jam is important too. Your group may need to change course, rescope your game, or respond to life events and emergencies, and it can feel great to celebrate small victories together as your game progresses. Um, and finally, our last principle is to imagine otherwise. So we want QG Jam to be an imaginative exercise in how game jams could relate differently to work in capitalism. What could game jams look like in a world without the pressure to constantly produce? How can we use game jams to create that world instead of recreating the same old power structures that exclude queer and otherwise marginalized folks from games and academia? In your groups, this means that you should try to avoid replicating workplace dynamics that feel familiar but cause harm. Try not to pressure or police your teammates. Check in, step away if you need to, and try to empathize with teammates if they have to step away, even if it means your project doesn't turn out the way you had hoped. Lift up and support everyone who attends. The experience everyone has participating in QG Jam is more important than any resulting games. 
by jamming together, we are all creating something new, weird, and different together. Something that will give us relief from the pressures of work and productivity instead of adding to it. And maybe we'll get some rad gains out of it, but if not, that's okay too. So those are our principles. If you want to read them on your own, uh, you can go to our website, qgcon.com slash qgjam-2023. Um, I will have the mod post it in just a minute. Thank you. So uh, this is this is the schedule uh, for QGGM. Uh, these, you know, the exact timing uh, is usually in uh, Eastern, uh, you know, coastal uh, United States and, and Canadian time. Uh, so we're having our, our symposium today, uh, and the symposium serves uh, as the the sort of theme of the jam. Uh, you know, the inspiration for your games. Uh, and after the symposium, uh, if you haven't already. Uh, we invite you to join our Discord. Uh, it's a great place to, to find a team. Uh, we've got a forum style channel where you can post with tags about what kind of level of involvement you're looking for, uh, you know, what you're look you're hoping to make, uh, whether that's like a portfolio piece or just, you know, a weird experiment, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, and uh, and so we'll, we hope that you'll you'll find a great team there. Uh, and then we're gonna spend uh, this this next upcoming week. Uh, on making the games. So the last day to upload a game uh, to itch.io through the jam uh, is uh, next Saturday, the, the 21st. Uh, on Sunday, uh, we hope that you'll uh, you'll take a nice long break. Uh, you know, we uh, we are going to endeavor to, to not really be active uh, on the Sunday uh, unless there is like a real uh, emergency. Uh, and we, we hope that you'll you'll take that time too. Uh, and then as of Monday, uh, we'll be starting to play the games. We hope that uh, you know everyone will take the time to uh, to play each other's games uh, and and you know uh, leave comments, uh, give feedback. Um, and then from there uh, on on Saturday the twenty eighth, uh, we're going to have sort of a a showcase and discussion uh, of uh, of the different games that were made. Yeah, and then I just wanted to uh, make a few really quick notes um, about sort of the details of this jam. Uh, as Jess said, there's a forum uh, type of channel where you can find a team um, and you can organize your um, posts by different tags that will let you describe what your sort of commitment levels are um, and what roles you want to explore and then what your goals are. Um, tech support, uh, we have a channel called Jam Troubleshooting. Um, our sort of tech support person, Andrew, has uh, made a post there about what they are able and unable to help you with. Um, but I recommend that you take a quick read of it. And if you have any questions, you can always tag them. Um, scholars, if there are people who are interested in participating in the jam that have no game design experience and no interest in actually making a game, uh, we have a specific role for people who want to be scholars. Uh, the idea with a scholar is that you will join one team and uh, participate however your group sees fit. That might look like observing, it might look like asking interesting questions at specific moments, um, or it might look like maybe interviewing your team members and asking them how they came to enjoy the role that they're taking on. Uh, we want to be sort of open about what scholarship could mean in the context of a game jam and what it might mean to have a role specifically, um, specifically marked out for people to observe and not to create necessarily. So if you have any questions about that, if you're interested in doing that, uh, you can always um, at the organizer or the volunteer role, and they can tell you more about it. And we can also help you find a team as a scholar. Um, after these opening remarks in just a couple of minutes, we'll be getting into our two panels. And we've had a lot of questions about what the theme for this jam is gonna be. I think in a lot of traditional jams, we would maybe start playing a cool video right now, and it would say something like apples, and like the theme of the jam would be apples. And then you would have to go and make a game that has something to do with the word apples. Uh, this jam is a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be discussing 
um, sort of openly to broad topics and the panel discussions themselves are gonna be the theme. So any kind of inspiration you get from the discussions that we're having, uh, any specific moments that interest you, those can be the inspiration. We are not interested in like policing submissions or being like very um, strict about what how people interpret the symposia, but um, this structure is intended to encourage you to sort of think deeply about the ideas that we discuss in the panel through game design. Uh, so that is the relationship between the symposium and the idea of a jam theme and the game jam that you'll be doing starting later today. Um, and lastly, jam safety. If you have any sort of interpersonal difficulties with your um, jam teammates, you can add a volunteer who will help you mediate, pass through them. Um, we also have a safety coordinator who we will be shouting out in the chat after the symposium. If there is anybody in your group who um, violates our code of conduct, uh, people who engage in behavior that is inappropriate um, or any kind of bigotry, uh, we have a person on hand who will be specifically handling that. Um, and you can also message us, the organizers, or at the organizer role, or go to the Ask an Organizer channel at any time, and uh, we will be happy to help you and talk you through whatever, whatever is going on. So I just want to add for tech support, although we have like a tech support volunteer, uh, if there is a problem that you know how to solve, uh, and somebody posts about it in the tech support channel, and you feel like sharing your knowledge, uh, you know, please, please go ahead and do so. You know, um, we encourage you to support each other uh, through like different questions uh, and different things if you have the time and bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, so this event was made possible uh, in part with the support of Clever Endeavor, uh, and you too uh, can also help to fund our work. Uh, so there'll be somebody posting a link in the chat. Uh, if you want to, uh, you can go to QGCon.com, uh, and there's a donate button uh, in our menu. All righty. Yeah. Uh, also, a, a quick note, we are an entirely volunteer-run organization um, and have been for a while. So your donations go directly to being able to support future events, to honoraria for speakers, which we are um, always adamant about providing. Um, in the past, we've offered travel support, uh, which is a very rare thing for conferences to offer. And if we run live events in the future, that's something that we would hope to do. So uh, your donations would mean a lot to us. So thanks for listening. Uh, we're only three minutes late, uh, despite our tech issues. Uh, and we can, uh, we can go on to the symposium. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes. We can get started. I would say we should maybe take a five minute break um, yeah. just to let people, I know people were mentioning that they would love to have breaks throughout, uh, which we will between the two panels. Um, if people wanna go and get a glass of water or a coffee, uh, maybe at 1.10, we can start our first panel, which is going to be about queer worlds. Sounds good. So we'll see you all back here at 1.10. Hello, welcome back. Um, I think it is time to get started with our first panel. Uh, we are going to begin by introducing all of our speakers and then the way that the panel is going to be structured is we're going to ask questions that um, our panelists can respond to in any order. Our hope is that uh, what will begin as direct responses will sort of evolve into people talking to each other, responding to their own ideas. Um, in other words, uh, our panelists don't necessarily have like free written pre-scripted responses to our questions, um, but uh, are fostering a kind of open discussion. Uh, and our first panel, the theme is queer worlds. So, uh, as I introduce each of our panelists, if you could just uh, unmute yourselves and turn your cam on and like say hi so that you'll appear on the screen, um, that would be great. Uh, 
and Jess, if you want to like take turns, so I'll introduce one person, you introduce one person. Um, so I'll begin by introducing Caro Assercion. Um, Caro is an interdisciplinary artist working in theater, visual art, and analog games. Their practice centers on dramaturgical theory, collaborative processes, and small worlds crafted with intention. Oh no, we can't hear you, Caro. Oh no, we still can't hear you. Of course, it worked in the mic check and now it doesn't work. Um, sure. Uh, Yeah, we, we always, we have to have more technical difficulties. The technical difficulties is our special guest at the, at the symposium today. Um, you know, glitches are very queer is all, you know, so, gonna, so, much, so much lit on glitches. We're queering technology through the glitch. Welcome back, Kevl. Hello, is this working now? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you, hello. Happy to be here, thank you for joining. All right, thank you for having me. Thank you. We're so happy too. Uh, and so uh, next I'll introduce uh, Kawika uh, Guillermo. Uh, so uh, Kawika Guillermo is the award-winning author of Open World Empire, Race, Erotics, and the Global Rise of Video Games, two novels, uh, and the prose poetry collection Nimrods, a fake punk self-hurt anti-memoir, published by Duke University Press in September 2023. Uh, he is the co-editor, along with Tara Fickle, of the edited collection Made in Asia slash America, Why Video Games Were Never Really About Us, forthcoming in April 2024. His first video game, Stamped, an anti-travel game, uh, is an adaptation of his first novel uh, and will be released in November 2023 by Analgesic Productions. Hello. Oh, good. My mic is working. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, next, I'll introduce uh, Chris Prasad. Um, yes, uh, Chris is a PhD candidate at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. His research focuses on queer media and cultural production in social media, games, and erotic contexts, as well as STS approaches to AI and emerging technologies. Uh, Chris, if you would like to uh, come say hi. Oh, there we go. Okay, camera. We did it. Yay. Hi. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hello. I was worried my mic would also not work for a moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all have that fear instilled in us. So happy that you're here. Uh, and uh, last, I'd like to introduce Austin Walker. Uh, so Austin Walker lives at the intersection of development, academia, journalism, and criticism. He's the IP director at Possibility Space, where he leads a team of writers on an innovative new game project. Previously, Austin's work appeared on Paste, GameSpot, Giant Bomb, and Waypoint, which he founded at Vice Media in 2016. Since 2014, Austin has hosted the tabletop role-playing podcast, Friends at the Table, which blends collaborative storytelling and critical world building. Welcome, Austin. Hi, so glad to be here. So this this is our amazing panel. Uh, I am so excited to get to the chance to speak with you today. Uh, and I'm just scrolling up to my first question, uh, which I lost when I went down to your uh, lovely uh, bios. So uh, to start us off, uh, I'd like to ask you, how do you see your design, story, storytelling, and scholarly practices in the context of building new structures and remapping old ones. So in other words, uh, please introduce your work uh, for folks in the audience who may not be familiar. Uh, and anyone who's ready to, to take the mic uh, can, can go right ahead. We're all being very polite. We're all being extremely polite. No one's going to do it. This is brutal. <laughs> I can go first. 
Okay. Aren't you doing it, Austin? <laughs> okay. Um, hi, I'm Chris. Uh, I study, among other things, uh, queer game studies, live streaming. Um, I'm really interested. I don't know why my camera just went out for a moment, but hopefully it'll come back. I'm really interested in um, basically how we can imagine queerness otherwise, like not just through representation, but through performance. Um, I just edited a book about uh, live streaming that came out for MIT Press. It's open access. It's called Real Life in Real Time. Um, uh, my chapter was about drag queens and how they reappropriated and sort of reimagined live streaming as a technology to do shows like during the pandemic and, and sort of afterwards. Um, so I'm just really interested in like, how do we take these technologies that weren't necessarily built for us and like turn them into cool platforms to do the things that we want to do. Um, in the context of like games, um, more specifically, my work has addressed queer representation historically, different kinds of queer representation. I'm always interested in representation that goes beyond like, these two characters are the same gender and they kissed. We did it. Like that sort of shows up in I think a lot of, especially mainstream sort of video game production. I feel like the coolest queer stuff, as many of you know, happens in indie games and in spaces like this where people make like a weird thing in three days and then like share it with their friends. So yeah. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, is there someone who would like to go next? I will never volunteer you, but know <laughs> that I'm sitting here being like, please? Oh, I was gonna, when I ask questions, I'm gonna volunteer you, so <laughs> you know, be prepared. Uh, I'm Austin. Um, uh, you heard the intro before. Um, I would say that, you know, I, I think a lot, I think a lot about my queerness, um, the way Bell Hooks talks about, not just being about who you're sleeping with, that's like a component of it, um, but also this kind of um, uh, almost like an oppositional living, living at odds um, in a world, and needing to invent places where you can thrive. Um, and and for me, it's not just places where you can thrive, um, but it's uh, inventing worlds where you can pose questions. Um, and so, for friends at the table, uh, pose questions are often hard to pose in real life for threat of violence, for threat of for lack of time. Um, Friends of the Table is an actual play podcast, which means it is a, a collaborative role-playing game podcast. Um, I tend to be the GM in that uh, in that show, um, but not always. And always, it is the case that it is not my show the way you might think of a traditional D and D dungeon master who is who has a story that they're looking to tell. Instead, um, I'm one of the things I like to do. In, on that show, and even before this as an editor, um, uh, as someone who engages in discursive spaces, um, now with a team of writers, is to open up spaces for people to begin to imagine other worlds um, and to and to, to uh, tangle with difficult uh, and often oppositional um, positions that they have inside of fictional spaces. Um, you know, I think a lot about the value that failure brings uh, to to stories and to the self and the ways in which that failure in real life is often um, a very dangerous thing to let yourself have, even, even if it is deeply tied up in the beauty of queerness. Uh, and one of the things I love about imaginary worlds is that these are spaces where failure is accessible um, uh, in ways, uh, and I mean accessible and not just approachable. I mean, it is, it is uh, there is not the same material cost uh, to, to the sorts of failure that a disabled or erased body might uh, or person might feel in, in the world or might come against. And so, uh, you know, in shows like Friends of the Table, um, we are trying to do deconstructive work around genre spaces. We're trying to inject queerness, not in terms, not just in terms of who is kissing who, as Christopher said, um, but also asking questions about what queerness's relationship is to capitalism, um, to ideas of nature versus culture, if such a binary exists in any way, which I don't really believe it does, um, and, and similar things like that. So really for me, it's about opening up spaces where oppositional question making can can uh, proceed. That's okay. Yeah. The, twisty, the twisty ways that we we approach queerness. The I, I always think of that Sarah Ahmed quote uh, about the word itself twisting around and to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. cover those different registers. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll I'll jump in here a little bit. I think um, you know, as a a game designer and as somebody who likes to play and um, you know, uh, thinking thinking in the game space, I'm always really interested in kind of something you've spoken to Austin in collaborative play. Um, you know. 
play that allows and empowers everybody who's involved to take agency and and build together. Um, a lot of the analog games that work that I do is GMless or has a, a modified structure where there's you know not necessarily one person who is um, is the director is the the dungeon master in that way. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from um, comes from my my background in theater. Um, I work primarily as a dramaturg and as an artistic producer. Um, and I think I, you know, think about, I, I work in, you know, I, the, the areas of theater that are, are a little bit more subversive. And I always think about dramaturgy as a way of shaping and reshaping stories um, and of understanding another person's artistic vision. You know, whether that is working closely with a playwright, working closely with a director, working closely with a design team, um, it's it's an act of service. It's about understanding an artistic vision that you know a person or a team wants to create and helping them articulate that. Um, and and dramaturgy is very much about being having having one foot in the room and having one foot you know being an advocate for the audience, understanding okay when when does this story that we're trying to tell align with a pre-existing structure, whether that's a, a narrative structure, whether that's a visual language that the audience is familiar with, um, and and when does telling the story in a in a normative way or in a way that people are going to understand serve it, and when is it necessary to break the form? When is it necessary to push that in a way that is is going to be new or is going to um, kind of challenge and and upset, okay, what is what is kind of that traditional um, expectations that the audience is necessarily kind of bringing to um, into their space, and so I really think that kind of informs um, both how I work as a theater maker and as a as a game designer. Uh, I guess I'll go, I'll go last <laughs> in this roundabout. Um, I'm Chris Patterson, or I write scholarly uh, work about games. As Chris Patterson, my patrilineal name, and I write creative work. Um, under my matrilineal name, Kubica Guillermo. Um, and I got started in um, game studies, I guess, as a field back in like 2004, 2005, um, when I started reading it. And there wasn't a lot about queerness in games um, back then. Uh, there wasn't a lot of conventions or spaces, really. Um, and I just kind of hated it, hated the whole field <laughs> of, of people studying it, I guess. Not the players or the fans, but... Um, and so I spent about like a decade just thinking about it from the outside. Um, and then I started to realize that there were spaces being opened up by a lot of really amazing people um, at the time in like the early 2010s, I guess, late 20, late aughts, I guess we say. Um, and then I wrote this book, uh, Open World Empire, Race, Erotics, and the Global Rise of Video Games, um, which is basically argues against this like techno utopic um, view of games um, that what I basically just hated on <laughs> for over a decade um, and instead I try to look at games as like erotic technologies erotic and queer technologies that initiate forms of intimacy and coupling and aftercare um, and there's a chapter of it where I actually talk about Austin Walker <laughs> and um, I talk I use this term lud ludophilia to talk about some journalists and um, twitch streamers who really inspire me when I watch them because it's just like they're enacting what I feel <laughs> when I play games. Um, and so I use a, this kind of, like Austin was saying and Chris was saying, this broader and more expansive view of, um, of uh, erotics and queerness as a kind of constant unsettling and deviation from given norms of straightness and whiteness, <laughs> um, but also not to try and like idealize it in that way either, because it is something that can still continue to be very complicit in like colonial empire. Um, as we kind of see in a lot of the pink washing that's been going on even recently. Um, and so uh, there, there is this quote from Austin that I just like to poke fun at with, <laughs> since he's here, um, that I quote in the book, uh, where he's, um, uh, this is a Waypoint video from like, I think it must have been like a decade ago now, but he's Almost. talking about flower, sun, and rain. Yeah. Uh, and he says, this game isn't fun. The point is, isn't to have a good time while looking around interesting locations. The point, I think, is that this game hates you. You have to walk everywhere, and walking is incredibly slow. And then it counts the amount of steps, so you know exactly how much time you've wasted. It's mean. It's cruel. I kind of love it. Um, and having that kind of a <laughs> that kind of narrative on games for me, it's, 
go ahead. <laughs> it's all there because there's context to this that you don't know, right? Which is uh, that video is a short form video. So we launched Waypoint. I push hard. Waypoint was a website, truly was a website now uh, that launched at Vice uh, in, for Vice Media uh, eight years ago now, seven years ago now. Um, so that video is from about seven years ago. Uh, it launched on October 31st on Halloween 2016, I think. Um, etched in my memory, Halloween's forever will be associated with trying to launch a website. It was 2016 because the election was about to happen, and and the last thing that happened on this big 72-hour live stream was um, some new development that that would uh, push Hillary lower in the polls just before the election. Anyway. We really wanted to do long form game script videos because that was something we loved inside of the realm of uh, YouTube, you know, video creation. We, we looked at the work um, of folks there who who were, you know, people like Aaron Signal and Jacob Geller, uh, who's doing, I think, by the way, a, a, um, uh, a stream right now, a charity stream for reproductive health care. Uh, so people should go look that up after after uh, the stream today is done. Um, and we really wanted to do that, but Vice's short form, Vice's media you know, video department was really pushing us towards short form content because that is what the pivot to video had revealed. Everything has to be about three minutes long. And so I was explicitly adopting a piece, a parafictional piece I'd written in grad school. It was the piece that got me into, it was the piece I submitted to from my master's program to get into my PhD. It was about flower, sun, and rain. That was about 30 pages long. That was about a time that I was at a party talking about flower, sun, and rain. And where uh, my my conversation with that person, with, with one of the other game critics, I was a well-established game critic, was then plagiarized and turned into a column on a major, in a major like publication. This is not a thing I've ever named this person. This is someone who I'm still like vaguely on good terms with, so I'm not going to name and shame them on this. And plagiarized is strong, right? It was it was a conversation at a party. Like we we talk about the sort of um, you want to talk about the erotics of this, right? Uh, and it was about this this it was about something else, sort of. But it was while I was playing Flower, Sun, and Rain, and about the affective experience of playing this game that is, you know, predates the walking simulator as a pejorative genre by about five, 10 years. It comes from a different lineage of games. Flower, Sun, and Rain is a Japanese game. I think most people associate the walking simulator, quote unquote, with Western independent spaces. Um, and all of that gets carved away into a three minute video where they're saying, really, can you do it in two minutes? Um, and truly, this is what it is to be queer and to try to make queer art and try to have queer ideas inside of commercial and capitalist spaces, right? Is like all of that has to get carved away down to, I think this game kind of hates you. And also, by the way, you're trying to make an, a, a video for the Vice audience, not even for the Waypoint audience. So you can't even assume a certain level of um, uh, interest or knowledge about games writ large so says the head of Vice Digital Video, right? So incredible, con I, I love this as an example uh, because of how it puts into question immediately, what does it mean to try to say something queer inside of capitalist spaces? What gets lost in the translation? And, and what are the times that we decide to make those deals and say, you know what? I still get to talk about flowers, sun, and rain. I still get to put attention on this thing that no one else is talking about. I still want to draw attention to questions that other people haven't even had yet, right? So, um, you know what's what's really astounding about that was the yes, I think you got so much across in those short videos, and I'm not just. I think broadly, I like to think about games alongside poetry a, li a bit more than prose, and I think the the uh, default is usually prose in some kind of genre. Form. Um, but what I liked about those short videos and kind of the briefness in general uh, and the way that we talk about games is it is really inspiring. Like I could take whatever Austin was saying and turn it into something completely different. And probably because I didn't read the whole thing, you know, because I didn't have the 30 minute version of it that I could just project right, right. things onto it yeah. um, in a like, kind of queer, campy way that I try to do in the book. Um, yeah, so that's you raised poetry. Uh, yeah, I'm, we're just in it now because I was gonna ask Caro something. Because when I think about that exact thing, Kawika, of the games as poetry, um, I think a lot about some of Caro's work in the physical game and the, the, the tabletop game space. Um, and I'm curious if that is part of how that relates to queerness, uh, for you, Caro, and if you could talk a little bit about that part that for people who don't know what 
your role playing games and storytelling games stuff is like and where that overlaps yeah i'd be i'd be happy to jump in i think um but the the works i'm probably most well known for are um i've i've been self publishing since table uh, tabletop since 2019 probably most well known for uh, i'm sorry did you say street magic which is a city building story game uh, it's a gmless game about um you know collaboratively creating uh, a world together, you know, queer, queer worlds. It's about um, creating a city and populating that space with, you know, neighborhoods and then going into those neighborhoods and and exploring, okay, we're gonna build out a, a communal space that we can all explore together in that way. Um, I'm, I'm also known for a handful of other games, but I think that's the one that um, feels, feels most apt in this conversation. Um, and I think as far as queerness goes in that, um, you know, kind of tying back to what I was saying earlier about uh, collaborative play and and really making something that opens up um, kind of what you, you were speaking to earlier, Austin, queerness as multiplicity, right? Recognizing that everybody uh, in a game and uh, in, in an analog game space, you know, when you sit down to, to tell a story with your friends, you are doing that with a number of people who have experiences that might not, you know, align entirely with your own. And, um, you know, everybody is bringing their own truth to the table, uh, so to speak, and recognizing that um, that doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, if I'm going to introduce, you know, I'm going to uh, add a coffee shop to this, this game, or I'm going to add a neighborhood to this place, um, I might describe this in one way and have a really vivid picture of it in my head. And somebody else might say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to build off of this in a way that is not necessarily the same as the the image that I conjured in my mind. That doesn't mean, oh, this you know this place is is different. It just means that we're exploring it from different perspectives. Um, and I think that um, you know that postmodern re recognition of okay, we can all bring those those perspectives to the table and. There is no singular objective truth to the way that we all um, move through the world. You know, my experience is true. Your experience is true. They might not necessarily be the same, but that doesn't invalidate either truth. Um, is is very much, I think, uh, one of the things that I try to uh, communicate in in my games. And uh, yeah, how I how I move through the world and how I approach my my design in that way. Does that get to the nugget of the question, or? Yeah, you know, I I will say I, I almost had um in in mind stuff like Augur or, what is the first thing I saw from um Rever Reverie Cycle? Is that right? Reverie Cycle, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, with um, with the question of like game the I mean everything you just said is awesome and also a hundred percent if people don't know your work with Street Magic where I'm sorry to say Street Magic your work with that game please go check that out also but but thinking about the ambiguities that Kuika mm -hmm. was just talking about and uh you know the the way in which a ambiguity provides a space for for um not just a space for queerness but ambiguity itself and insisting on ambiguity is perhaps one of uh is is a regular practice of queerness for me and and i think um the, it is a really generative one in those games, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, I yeah, I can, I can. Oh, go ahead. I was, I was just gonna say, I was intrigued by Carl what you were saying about your relationship to theater, and how that might inform some of the game because there's, there's, there's such an interesting intersection of you know not not every play being the same because the the audience's mood and affect will kind of affect the actors and things. And there's so that, that you have this almost like traditional interactive form of like art and media that I think has been inspiring to some game makers. And I, I think in game studies, it's been something much more commonly done nowadays. And they like to term use the term world making rather than world building, um, which I think comes from a lot of theater studies as a way to um, think about the how that interactive experience and collaborative experience just kind of uses all of the social political world to inform the world rather than the um, a, a kind of world building that just comes out of you know an author or a company's um, imagination. Totally, totally. I think, 
you know, when I think about theater, one of the the things I, I think about, I sort of spoke to this earlier, is um, is clarity, right? And it's about making sure that your audience has an understanding of what's happening. And so I think it's it's kind of funny, Austin, when you're speaking to ambiguity. I I think in my game space, that's sort of where I give myself permission to be to be nebulous, to not necessarily have to say, okay, this is the emotional intent behind you know, when this actor is delivering this line or here's what, you know, this the scenic designer, this lighting designer is supposed to to represent in that moment. Um, you know, when I'm when I'm designing games that that have that degree of ambiguity, it's um yeah, having that that freedom to explore. I think uh Augur is is definitely one of those. Reverie cycle, which um I'll I'll just shout out my co-designer for that game, Eda Mendez, was uh was a collaboration. Um, which is very much rooted in this idea of memory and cyclicality and, you know, having a, a space to explore and giving yourself permission, like you're saying, not to have, um, not to necessarily need a definitive answer to, here's what this means specifically in this moment. You know, here's, here's the symbolism, here's the allegory, here's how all of these connect back to the root. Um, because queerness is messy, and you don't necessarily have to have a clear-cut answer for everything in the way that um, you know you you might if you're trying to really drive a point home in that in that same way. I think there's some really interesting resonances and tensions here, right? I think on the one hand, the notion of queerness as multiplicity, as ambiguity as a kind of acknowledgement of multiple realities and possibilities. But then on the other hand, queerness, having to transpose queerness through systems of power, through capitalism and colonial empire and uh, the limitations of two minute long videos. Um, it reminds me almost of Hito Sterl's essay in defense of the poor image, like the idea of queerness as a kind of image that gets that gets circulated that begins in one space and circulates through co different conversations and ambiguities but has to end up in this kind of like like deprecated tiny like 200 by 200 uh <laughs> like jpeg right um like a metaphorical jpeg not a, not a literal jpeg to be clear um and i think that that tension is a really interesting one to carry through into our discussion of worlds and world building um I wanna give a little introduction to maybe what we mean by world building to start us off on that specific topic. I think Kavika mentioned um, the sort of tension between world building and world making. That's really interesting to me. Um, media and pop culture have become obsessed with the idea of creating worlds lately, um, but it's often unclear what we actually mean by the term world building. It implies a focus beyond individual character psychologies on broader social and environmental forces, but it also seems to suggest a kind of open, limitless creative possibility. I've seen ads for like banks that talk about world building, uh, right? And while world building has a history in active, activist spaces and radical imaginations, there's a kind of distinct capitalist vibe, like I noted to the term today, from metaverses to transmedia franchises to the use of AI to cheaply populate worlds with content, sort of leveraging this idea of creative possibility and limitlessness towards uh, more nefarious ends. So um, for all of you, what do you find useful, helpful, or positive about the term, if anything? And how do you contend with the aspects of world building that seem to attract capitalist thinking? Um, and Chris, I, it's been a little yeah. while since you've talked, so I want you to start us off. I have lots of thoughts about this, so <laughs> that's good. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll start with the positive because I could talk about the negatives for a while. But the positive, I think, is like, I think it's helpful, particularly for people who are like new to creative or sort of performance spaces to have like, okay, you make a character. Where does that character come from? Who do they interact with? Like, uh what things from the quote unquote real world do you want to bring into like the space that you're creating cool that's all great but i think recently and this is some of my newer work is thinking about generative ai and sort of the tensions that exist with uh, that um and one that's been fascinating to me is this idea that like so in the history of like art and cultural production, there's this idea that like art, this is like the art world's like Becker stuff, the idea that art is like a practice that um, 
you know, has this whole assemblage of there are people that help the business of art and people that help the people who learn how to make art and there's people that distribute the art, blah, blah, blah. But generative AI has created this idea that like everyone can build their own worlds, even if they have no artistic ability or inclination or whatever. And that's like good. And it seems to skip over the fact that like there's so much political and social stuff that goes into making things that like as humans, we have all these creative impulses that like don't just emerge out of thin air. I don't know. So like, I feel like the the capitalist capture of world building implies that like content is it. Like there's nothing else. You just make content. We need more content. And like, that's sort of what I think is like circulating in the sort of push to make, I'm not a total generative AI skeptic. I think there are some interesting things you can do with it. There's lots of really cool artists that are incorporating it into their work, but like, I feel like the commercial framing of gen AI is actually really speaking to this tension about world building where like everyone needs to be able to make a world. And then like, that's it. That's where it stops is like, everyone needs to be able to make things cool. So yeah. I don't know if that like raises, if that like has. There's so much there, right. Where, where it's also, um, it is a, a closed system fed on, uh, uh, pre-established material where any of the biases inside of that pre-established material, including simply what the weighting, what the, 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 uh, not, not the weighting that someone would go in and add, but the weighting that comes simply from the amount of a certain type of material, um, uh, leads generative AI towards re repeating things that are already in the kind of cultural milieu. Um, you know, there is a, is, is there a subaltern to, uh, is there a new modality of subaltern, which is the person for whom their speech cannot penetrate into a large language model? They can't push the model anywhere, right? Um, uh, they don't. There's not enough people repeating that thing to get fed in in such a way that it shifts where the model is. Um, uh, what gets repeated, and, and what what I, what do those people lose access to? Imagine you're a person who wants to create a world because you're in a world that tells you that it's good to create worlds because that's a financial pursuit of yours. Um, what did they shave away from themselves by moving towards doing it with a generative AI model instead of doing it in other forms, including other forms that might still include algorithmic play or prompting or collaboration, things that, that eradicate the idea of the lone altor still, um, that get away from this, the idea that like, oh no, there's the artist on one side and there's like the chat GPT fake artist, non-artist on the other side. You can eradicate that binary and still have all this other really good critical space in, in between, but you they're closing themselves off to those other possibilities because they're saying either I'm the lone auteur who is putting you know a franchise either I'm Stephen King, uh, I'm I'm like the franchise maker right I'm mm -hmm. I'm George R R Martin or I I'm the everyman who has to use ChatGPT and I'm happy to use that instead right there's all this other space in the middle and it has been eradicated because the market pushes us towards those two models, right? The, the genius creator or now a market solution for everybody. And I think that that's for me, one of the most frustrating things in this moment. Yeah. And like, I really love what you just brought up is that there's that middle space. I mean, I I've been doing some experiments with uh, a research group at USC called the civic imagination project run by Henry Jenkins. And we have this thing where like, we're trying to think about how you can like prompt civic, especially for like teenagers and young people, like prompt civic engagement through like things like Gen AI. So like, uh, what if you got a bunch of teens together and you were like, okay, we're gonna like play with ChatGPT and uh, how would you like your like school curriculum to look in this particular way? And then they'd like play with it and they like, you know, whatever, or different modes that you can get people to creatively engage with those tools. But no, that's like completely removed from the whole like, we need to create the next iteration of Marvel, yeah. uh, like whatever pipeline. Through, even if it isn't yeah. literally that, the thing that I'm reminded of is in um, in Games of Empire. There's this there's this bit in the towards the beginning of it talking about the literal rocket scientists using early computing technology to develop early video games and our early computer games and. Uh, leadership, you know, military leadership saying like, yeah, good, let them play on the system because that play will, will route us back towards making better missiles, right? Um, the, the play space that capitalism opens up for us is often 
allowed to exist with the particular borders and boundaries that it has because that play space is productive in a way that capital will capture. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it is really frustrating because it, it makes even well-intentioned efforts inside of the space fundamentally complicit in what follows, especially if they don't come hand in hand constantly with a critical counter argument, right? Um, uh, and and who has, all, and I mean this in a kind of dismissive way, but I also mean this seriously, like who has time to book every project, to release every project with a list of caveats and demands that you, hey, listen, we use this technology because X, Y, Z, but we think that it's bad to use da 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 da. All that stuff is going to get erased, right? The only thing that comes out is you made a really good project that was successful, and also you used, you know, uh, Dolly to make the art for it, right? And like, it doesn't matter how many essays you release alongside it saying, here are our concerns with image generation tech and da 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 da. If you're selling that project and it's drawing eyes, and people are going, wow, they use this thing. You mm -hmm. are fundamentally complicit in in a move towards eliminating uh, uh, equitable labor, uh, uh, you know, situation for artists, for instance. Right? It's can tough. I, it's tough out here. I, I was just wanted to um, get back to the uh, uh, process driven AI and how um, I, I feel like what's one thing that's kind of being lost a bit in the conversation, um, but or maybe just being talked about uh, tangentially, is a bit the. Um, to me, it feels like a logical extension of what a lot of companies have been wanting in games, like since the '80s, where like there's this this desire to dismiss the like meaning of games or like what you know the creator designer might be thinking about or being inspired by when making the games. And like Atari had like these rules back in the day of like all the designers and the, the creators and the storytellers couldn't talk to media, right? And they would do anything to try and keep them from um, trying to reveal where the origins of their stories came from. And I think there's there's something like in generative AI where it's just like, here, it's, there's a planet, you know, it was automatically generated. Um, there's no meaning about race or sexuality or anything or colonialism because it's just, it's just an AI that does it. And I think it's just this kind of, um, you know, thing that we've been seeing more and more in digital technology where all the responsibility and accountability is just kind of thrown off and companies are just incredibly happy to be able to do that. Um, not to say that there aren't a lot of like amazing, like radical possibilities um, with this kind of technology, but I think that seems to be one of the core like values in it is that we don't have to, you know, um, explain like, why Jar Jar Binks has that accent <laughs> or something like that. Um, or why, you know, the Jedi came out at a time when, um, you know, American empire was um, destroying uh, Indochina, right? And dropping more bombs than were dropped in all of World War II. Like, we don't have to make those connections anymore. Now it's just um, a computer that does it all in, in the same way that algorithms are also responsible for where bombs drop. And if civilians die, it's not us, it's the algorithm that chose that. And um, I, I feel like games are just kind of nonchalantly now trying to take advantage of that kind of unaccountability that we see um, in digital media worldwide. It, it feels as though we're right back at that uh, kind of erasure of context uh, and history, uh, you know, around, you know, the three minute video or like, you know, the stripping, the stripping of context or like the translation for palatability or, or that sort of stuff. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, Let's talk about world maps. So traditionally, uh, mapping and the idea of uncharted or unclaimed or you know objectively knowable space has got some pretty uh, you know colonialist associations, uh, a lot of uh, erasure of history and context there too. Uh, so how can we make maps differently, or how do you think we can design ways of mapping spaces to support? Uh, queer modes uh, or other like intersectional ways of remapping uh, anti-imperialism uh, and anti-colonialism. I'm I'm happy to jump in here to start. Uh, you know, just like the 101 thing that we need to you know say is like maps are by virtue like intrinsically reductive, right? Like every map has an agenda uh, because it's a tool. It's a tool that lets you communicate information distilling it down into a, a you know clarity um, and and with that you have to ask okay well what is the relevant information that's being communicated and that has all of these questions about okay who is this map for who is it relevant to 
who gets to decide what's included? You know, Kaylin, you were talking about the the 200 by 200 JPEG. It's like, okay, you are taking the world and and boiling it down into some diagram. Who's who's the map maker? Who's the audience? Who is the driving like dominant force that gets to decide what the map is and what's the dominant lens through which this map is being presented? You know, is it a, a geographic map of okay local local landmarks or features is it political you know we are we are seeing right now this uh this ongoing tension that's happening with uh palestine in terms of like political borders and recognizing that um you know there these maps are being drawn in different ways and they're being drawn by you know the dominant hegemonic force but recognizing i think in it come, you know, pushing back on imperialism and colonialism, like geography and politics aren't necessarily the only way that you have to define a map. You know, you can map interpersonal relationships, you can map conceptual, you know, you think about mind maps, uh, mind, mind mapping as, as a term. Um, you can think about, you know, your relationship to physical space, but it doesn't necessarily have to be literally the 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 ground that we walk on and the the borders that you know are are demarcated in politics in that way one of the things that i think is so important here that you hit on um and maybe i'm tell me if i'm rephrasing this or paraphrasing you incorrectly here but but is to resist the urge to suggest that the map is at any point a rep is natural is a representation of something natural which is i think really caught up I think that the occupation of Palestine and the, the uh, ongoing uh, conflict there, the ongoing uh, activity in Gaza right now, Israel, you know, um, forcing people to leave their homes, millions of people to move, uh, the ongoing the uh, housing in the West Bank and the further settler, settler colonial activity there um, is often framed inside of a sort of conceptual map not just the literal map of here is a place on in the world but a conceptual map that suggests uh how often do you hear people use the phrase it's complicated or it has always been uh it has always been a place where conflict happens or um this sort of retreat to the natural uh that that such a that this, you can't get away from this state of being um this is something that has always been and it will always be it will always be quote unquote complex. Um, and I think that when maps get used in the real world, it is often to insist on a sort of natural truth. Um, uh, and I think my favorite uses inside of queer space uh, or queer art specifically with not just mapping, but representation, representation not of uh, gender or sexual uh, identities, but representations of the world, uh, make that more complex or complicated or again uh, uh, ambiguous or nebulous. I think about a game like If Found um, where uh, you have this such a beautiful representation of the world and then it collapses in places. It falls apart the way homes and spaces are represented in that game um, uh, are really remarkable and the sense of self getting lost in that space uh, towards the end of, of, it's a short game, people should go play If Found, um, is just like stunning. Um, and to me, that is a sort of queer mapping, even though that's not a map game explicitly, right? Um, or something like Everest Pipkin's um, uh, uh, The Ground Itself, which mm -hmm. represents uh, which asks you to build a place, but think about it in radically different time scales. Um, uh, it, for people who don't know, the ground itself is a, a kind of a, a world-building game, sort of in the in the same space as something like the Quiet Year. Um, but instead of it uh, uh, happening over a short period of time, I mean, it can happen either over a radically short period of time, like seven days, um, as listeners to friends of the table know. Sometimes you just roll the dice weird, and you get a handful of days. Or it can happen over generations, thousands of years. Um, and, and the second you start thinking about a place in those terms, you, you lose the ability to refer to a nebulous, original, natural time. And instead you have to go, oh wait, oh, people actually lived here. Uh, and, you know, animals were here before us, plants were here before then, da, 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 da. And it, it, it makes that something you can't retreat to. And I think that's so important for, for doing any sort of critical or queer world building. I think in um in, in my game stamped, I try to, to do some of that. Um I try to develop like a sense of certain Asian space like spaces in Asia 
Um, it's called an anti-travel game. And like so part of what I'm trying to do, um, as Austin is kind of like gesturing toward, is well, one of my main gestures is to is to have this game about travel that has absolutely no maps in it. So there are there's there's no um even kind of like bird's eye view of what's happening throughout the whole game. Um, the, most of the game takes place with folks talking in a visual novel style in a bar. Um, and then all of the kind of flashbacks or returns to travel are through these very like blurred camera, like photos that you would, I would take when I was traveling, like with that little yellow camera that you would get and then everything would come out super blurred. <laughs> so it's either that or, um, with oil painting, we have an oil painting artist who who does some of, and it's, they're very abstract. Um, so there's no like like um, we've been saying there's no like neutral view of space, right? It all seems like uh, and any kind of discussion of it um, is to see like maps as a kind of imperial aftermath, right? It's the aftermath of war, the aftermath of colonization. Mm -hmm. That's what a map is usually depicting. Um, and so I try in the game to you know be completely against. Um, any kind of neutrality in that sense, I guess, and just see like what would happen if we just access these spaces through fuzzy pictures, fuzzy memories. Yeah. Um, but what happens halfway through the game is the iPhone comes out because the game takes place in 2008. <laughs> and so, so this is when I was traveling and living in Asia, that's when the iPhone came out. And I remember it just completely changing the way that I, that people thought about exploration and wandering because then you know the first thing you do at an airport is you get a, a sim card and then you just map everything and it becomes a kind of pokemon game of like collecting all these different tourist sites and um, not to say things were like less colonial or more <laughs> after that like they're, they're, they're both kind of problematic in, in their own ways but yeah. you know that feeling of neutrality with the map was really intensified uh, when you had these like digital maps that everybody was following along and so um, and then everyone was taking pictures with iPhones. And so right. suddenly all the blurry pictures that you would see on um, MySpace, <laughs> whatever people were using, suddenly they were like crisp and clear and then people were taking videos and now everything just seems like so, uh, yeah. There was this moment that, that you reminded me of from last year, one of the last year's um, uh, AGDQs, the, the awesome games done quick, where someone, uh, which people don't know, is a live stream, a charity live stream, where uh, players do speed runs of video games uh, in order to get money for for charities like Doctors Without Borders. Um, w one player did a speed run of GeoGuessr. Do you know what GeoGuessr is? Uh, mm -hmm. GeoGuessr is a game that drops you somewhere in the Google Map like Street View in the world, and you have to put a pin in the world where you think you are. And the closer you are, the more points you get. And there was a moment where they immediately identified where they were by saying, okay, I, I don't remember which country it was, but they said, I'm in this particular place in this particular nation in Africa because look, one, I you can look at who's around and what the languages are in terms of signage, but two, there are police cars in front and behind the Google car, which are escorting it as it does this because people would fuck with the cars because they didn't want to be mapped. And and meanwhile, guys going, uh, okay, uh, yeah, we're in Nigeria. Drop this here, yeah, it's because of the police cars. Da, da, da. All right, next. All right, now we're in Sweden. Da, 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 da. And like, it was like my brain just exploding of like, oh, if I was still in academia, this is <laughs> I'm writing this paper tonight. <laughs> like this is all happening right here. Um, Google sent a car. Uh, the car then got escorted. Uh, then that then those images got uploaded and updated year after year. Then someone did a live stream for Doctors Without Borders, and someone is speed running it and identifying that the police the, the it's from the policing that they're identifying where they are in the world. Incredible little you know uh, uh, you know uh, scenario that kind of says uh, a lot or that is dense with meaning to unpack. What a rich text, as they say. <laughs> Um, 100%. I totally had a tangent about geocaching caching that I was going to go on, but now I'm like just thinking about what you just said. Um, I'll, I'll do it briefly just because I, I had a weird collision of this yesterday or two days ago. So where I live in Los Angeles, they're piloting the Waymo cars, like the, oh, yeah. the autonomous vehicle with all the cameras that I think currently they use them in San Francisco. Um, the city of Santa Monica just approved that you could use them to drive around without people in them. Anyway, 
And I routinely have incidents where there's a charging station near where I live that crosses a crosswalk that I take often to get to the train station where they, I almost get run over like maybe 20% of the time, just like it's often. Um, but I had this really funny moment because there's a geocache location or something. I don't, I don't do this activity, but I know that they have like the QR codes and the GPS coordinates that they try to find right near where this intersection is. And I watched someone who was like staring at their phone, try like obviously doing this like playful sort of exploratory activity and like nearly collided with the very similar map based sensor based technology of the driverless car. Like, and it just was a moment where I was like, huh. This is bad, but I would also write something about this. <laughs> like I shouldn't, that's like, that shouldn't have been my first reaction. But I was like, wow, this is like such a playful intersection and a terrible intersection of like, and literal intersection of like mapping, like uh, our idea that if we could just navigate the world through this, like, obviously driverless cars often have like both the, what is the word for the cart cartographical representation huh. of where they're going, but also the sensors. And they sort of are supposed to assemble these things together in a way that makes sense that often people and dogs and people on bikes are not really a part of that yeah. representation of the world. Um, anyway, so I was trying to like, the police example just ruined that train of thought. Sorry, apologies. I, I think, I know, I'll good. find you this link because it. you need to write about this. I'll find you <laughs> the summer games done quick. From 2021 is when it was. I'll, after this is over, I'm going to link you all the the video because it's an amazing moment. Um, I think you hit two there though that makes me think about you know in terms of just useful advice in how do you do games with maps, how do you do world building that is queer, that is potentially anti-capitalist, that is potentially engaged in those questions. I think a lot about the game 80 Days, um, which was made by Inkle, led by Megna Janth, uh, who is brilliant. Um, and one of the things that it does that you just hit on is. Um, there's kind of a two, there's two things in this. One is like, it is a game about, for people who don't know, that is a game about the, it's a play on the classic, uh, uh, around the world in 80 days, uh, classic, um, you know, canonical text, uh, or, you know, of, 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 I guess it's not really speculative fiction, right? It's not really, uh, uh Vernian sci-fi in, in, in that place, but it's about someone who's doing a race around the world. Um, kind of at the the birth of the nation state, the birth of modernity. You know, they're taking trains and and uh, uh, hot air balloons and ships. And look look at how industrialization is is shrinking the world and bringing you closer. But instead of playing mm -hmm. as the protagonist of that story, the person who is the de facto the the English gentleman who's challenged a rival to this race, you play as Phineas Fogg, who is sorry, you don't play as Phineas Fogg. You play as Phineas Fogg's. Um, uh like butler basically um and one you're immediately positioned in the world in a in a uh you know maybe not i don't know that british butler is a marginalized position but it is in a particular material position uh one that has a perspective on the world that is not one of uh limitless wealth or uh, endless resources the lack thereof is actually a constant struggle for you as a player limitation is constant because you only have so much stuff you can carry from place to place um, the world map is 100% built through uh, and and conscious of this sort of uh, fact that this is that that the fact that the world got smaller was part of a colonial and imperial project. You're traveling on railroads built by empires. You're traveling on ships that carry sugar from the colonies to the imperial core. All of this is front and front and center. None of this is elided, and a special attention is played to it. And then importantly. You know, Megna wrote places for queer joy to emerge in the alleyways and the beachfronts, uh, places for cruising to happen. You know, it's not a it is not a dating segment, it's not a romance game explicitly, but some of the best, most um grounded and exciting uh bits of uh flirting and uh, romantic encounter and sexual encounter in games, I think, happened to me while playing 80 days. Um, it's also a game that's fundamentally built on the idea of uh, missed opportunities, right? Um, I don't. I, I guess you could play 80 days in such a way that your goal is to see every single narrative node, um, but it's not. It doesn't feel unfulfilling. It doesn't feel like you've missed something because you've gone down one road instead of another, uh, and in fact, makes that part of the sort of queer joy of exploration. Uh, I think so. Think about those things about finding spaces for joy in the corners of empire um even as you also think hey what built those corners how did those corners get built in the first place
That's a really fantastic point. I think thinking, like finding ways to think about or move through spaces differently, to like engage with space differently. Not, I think, I think I want to clarify that maybe nobody here is saying abolish the map or like stop reading maps. <laughs> uh, that you're, yeah. yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that's like possible, even if we wanted to say that, but. Yeah, um, there, there are two uh, two games that yeah. actually came to mind as Austin was talking. Get in the car, loser. Yeah, it's a sure. road, 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 queer road trip game. And then there was another one that I just played, like the Monsters road trip uh, visual novel kind of thing. It's uh, someone in the chat will remember it, but it came out not too like I think this year maybe. It's a part of like a a Monster, Prom, Monster Prom Three, the third yeah, of the Monster Prom games. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a road trip one. So they go on a road um, trip. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So like I think the road trip is be being you know not so much the Final Fantasy fifteen version anymore. <laughs> it's it's the queer fun monster version. Um, and I do love those kind of maps. And I think some of them might be proceed or they just seem randomized in some way. Yeah. Somebody else mentioned in the chat. Somebody mentioned Signs of the Sojourner, which is another game mm, that yeah. uh, deals with space and like moving and wandering really interestingly. Um. I wanted to move us from wandering through space uh, to wandering through time. And Austin, I'm so glad that you brought up the ground itself because that game was like super front of my mind when I was writing this next question, which is about the idea of history and the timeline. Um, so another common feature of world building processes is the timeline. Building worlds often involves imagining alternative histories, imagining what places used to be like, or even thinking in terms of deep time as they do in the ground itself, time scales in the thousands or millions of years. Queer theory often thinks about time as well, from fleeting pleasures to unrealized queer futures, to the strange senses of time that exist in moments of crisis and precarity. And I'm thinking specifically here about the AIDS crisis historically, and transphobic movements currently, which have created different forms of danger for queer people that create different kinds of experiences of time. In your own word, worlds, in your own worlds, how have you engaged with time and history? And what might it mean to take a queer perspective to the timeline to queerly reimagine the past, present, and future? Um, and I'll start with Caro. Yeah, um, when I when I saw this question, uh, the ground itself was was another game that you know immediately came to mind. Um, I mean, the other thing that, that came to mind uh, in terms of analog games was uh, Ben Robbins's Microscope, which is a game very much about chronology. It's about you know a group of players who create you know periods of time and and go into those periods and that, you know create specific events or or play out scenes with time. Um, street Mag or Pernal Microscope was the kind of initial basis, which I riffed off of when I was creating Street Magic. It started as a hack. Um, and something that all, I always found really interesting about Microscope is every period of time or event within that period is assigned, you know, as, as players decide, is this a light scene or is this a dark scene um, tonally? And and the, the question that I always had in that was, okay, well, Who's deciding this? Are we, as the writers' room, saying that this is, you know, light or dark, or you know, positive or negative, or what? What is necessarily the again, kind of going back to this idea of multiple truths and ambiguity? Like we can we can draw a circle and fill it in and say, oh, this, you know, was a was a, a dark turn for our history, um, but that doesn't necessarily uh, define anything specifically beyond you know what we're what we're putting on the page in that way and um, and when i was creating street magic like i i started thinking a lot about personal history and and really predicating on on the idea of you know sort of what you've spoken to about intimate uh in individual memories and something that i've i've often found with that game is like when you know and this happens a lot in world building games is you're you're drawing from real life and it's like, oh, this is an excuse for me to talk about my hometown or the time that I studied abroad or, okay, this cafe that we're, we're introducing is based on, you know, the cafe that I go to, but it's different in these ways. And, and tying world building to, you know, these, these intimate moments or these personal, um, personal memories that we have is, um, is really valuable as we are thinking about 
queer, you know, personal histories in that way. Um, which is not to say, you know, only write what you know. I think it's as we're doing world building, it's important to have space for for you know research and and creating your history as as a drawing on multiple perspectives, but leaving space to draw on you know personal memories and and the things about our our lived experience in the work that we create is um, is really really important just because you know that that also adds that level of oh this is this is coming from the truth in that way yeah really um i, I like that uh view of history as like through memory and trying to kind of um, put yourself in those spaces. And there's a, there's always been a really intriguing like sense of past for me where it's like before things become nostalgic. So like mm -hmm. right now we're all kind of nostalgic for the 90s for some reason, <laughs> but every there's like a 10 to 15, 10 to 20 year gap where there's almost like too much trauma or something that nobody really wants to think about. And then suddenly it becomes nostalgic and everyone wants to think about it again. Um, and I mean, for me, that's like, I try to like, I do this in multiple projects, but like in Stamped, for example, it's in 2008. And I, what I find fascinating about that time period of like 10 to 15 years is we were all like very politically in incorrect, but not in a way that we can like think is cool yet, you know, <laughs> it's still very cringy and it's still just like very messy. Um, and so like in Stamped, like for example, everybody, all the characters are kind of, you know, exiles from the US and they all are kind of hating on the US at this, you know, in, in the during the war on terror and, you know, all the other stuff happening. Um, but meanwhile, there's this new presidential candidate um, and that they've never heard of because they're not following any of the news. But everybody, all the Asian locals are telling them like, oh, there's this Indonesian guy who's um, running for a president. And they're like, that's impossible. There could be no nobody Indonesian, nobody Asian, because in Asia, a lot of people see Obama as Asian, right, um, in Hawaii, especially. And so that they're constantly facing this narrative of like, hey, there's this great, you know, black and Asian president and the, the, <laughs> the characters are just like, no, that's like, we don't care about that. You know, we're here to like, folk, uh, hate on America and focus on all the horrible history and everything and the colonialism. And I don't want to like, I'm not trying to say that like there was some um, redeeming or like idealist, you know, thing about that. I just think it's really funny <laughs> to, to throw all that history together and to see like how characters and people respond to it because there is i think in the us especially there's always that kind of contradiction you know in the uh, like who we attach hope onto and how that that kind of attachment is able to ignore or erase certain kinds of history or somehow redeem it like make mm -hmm. it meaningful in some way um and i like that the, the characters are tr are very messily trying to like, deal with all of that you know in their early 20s um, when they're really not prepared to do so. Um, but I, I find that like those kind of representations of, of recent history have always been kind of fun and for some reason really queer too, because they're in that mess, right? That nobody really wants to think about and that is so politically fraught, right? That we're not we haven't really integrated it yet into a narrative that makes us who we are. Um, yeah, and so yeah. Th that's one thing I'm trying to kind of think about more um, in all my projects. Christopher, I'm actually really curious about something, which is like, we're talking about time right now a lot in terms of historical time. But the thing that I've been thinking about with your work and specifically drag performers going on Twitch is that there is such a, when I think about drag, drag is organized around, you know, events, nights, mm -hmm. shows on stage. Um, uh, a drag performance could be a couple of minutes. It could be longer than that. And then the, if you think of the entire show as a as a performance, where everyone is in drag the whole time, or you know the performers are in drag, maybe some of the the people, you know, uh, other people in the audience are in drag, and certainly other people in the audience are queer across many different axes. That is still a very focalized, intense, you know, structured time event. Twitch mm -hmm. streaming can be an event. You can have events Twitch streaming, but there's also there's also um, a floatiness to Twitch time. You have, yes, you have an audience. Yes, they want you to stream every day or whatever. Maybe you even have appointment viewing. You're like, all right, on 7, p 7 p.m. on Thursdays, we're going to do this stream. But when you're in it like that, there's downtime, there's quiet beats, there's dead air. And I'm curious if that changes the performance of drag or in your experience watching, you know, participating in those in those streams, et cetera. If, if the kind of... Uh, the time nature of drag performance shifted when that medium changes and, and how that uh, uh, affects that in any way. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I I did a, a digital ethnography with um, a friend of mine, Matthew Perks, who's also a, used to be a drag queen who also streamed on Twitch. Um, and we were talking to some queens about how like the act of getting into like character on stream was a part of the performance and like actually right. kind of like in a weird way, I forget what phrase one of them used, like they felt like at first they kind of did it on accident. Like they were just like, all right, I'll just like, you know, like I need to get ready. I might as well just like entertain some people who are just like in my chat. And then it sort of became like a thing because they were like, oh, people were like asking me like things that they wouldn't have asked while I was like playing a game or doing some sort of like show or whatever. Like it sort of extended the, mm -hmm. um, the audience creator sort of interaction space, um, which I thought was really interesting. And they described it as like, it, you know, it's inherently vulnerable to sort of be like in half drag and like trying to like, uh, yeah. like, you know, do your like eyeliner correctly while also like answering like a very serious question like a 13 year old has asked you about like, I don't know, like, I, like <laughs> one of a, a couple of the, the queens that I, I know who do drag stuff on Twitch have described that like, they often get these like really deep, intense questions from like queer youth or young people in places where queerness is obviously more legally fraught or whatever. Um, and they're sort of just like, all right, well, I guess I gotta like answer this <laughs> while also like getting ready for my show. Um, yeah, so there's that. I mean, I think what's really interesting is that I've looked at both drag queens and artists in general, like drag kings and other um, non-binary drag artists who do what you could call, I guess, the live streamed version of a drag show, like the in-person mm -hmm. drag show. But then also there's, you know, people who stream and drag exclusively and that, like that's their kind of performance or people who do both of those things, which I think is really fascinating because there's like, are you playing for four hours? Right. Or are you doing like a 12 minute, you know, a eight to 12 minute like set or like, you know, those are very different contexts that I think play mm -hmm. with time in really interesting ways. I mean, and especially in the age where like one of the most famous drag queens in the world, Trixie Mattel is also a drag streamer. And, you know, it's like, that's very different than like a person who has 400 followers and like, it actually relies on like tips and donations to sort of, so like they're more inclined to do a show like all day or right. like, you know, like, um, anyway, so there's that. Before you ask that question, I was gonna mention um, some, I've been doing some work on this idea of like queer votive imagery or the idea that like, so votive imagery is like, you know, those like prayer candles that mm -hmm. um, in the, like some Latinx cultures, they have, you know, um, historical icons or people that are important to them beyond just like Jesus, et cetera, on them. Um, I came across these like votive candles of like queer figures like James Baldwin, Sylvia um, Rivera, uh, like uh, Marshall P. Johnson. And I was like, what's happening here? Because <laughs> it it's this really interesting, and I think to what- They're all over Canada, I've seen them everywhere. Yeah. Wow, I really? I think to what, to what Cuico brought mm -hmm. up is that like, um, there's often this like, flattening of real people and their political projects mm -hmm. onto sort of these like media representations. And in this case, it's like onto this consumable item. Anyway, so I would uh, really love- Putting Sylvia Rivera on a voting right, like, that you're selling for $7.99 or whatever way is more a wild that. thing to yeah, do. Yeah, and like, yeah, sure, I would really love are. if someone in the, in the game jam like did something with votive imagery or like thought about this. Cause I think it's such an interesting, cause there's this whole, or, or the Instagram industrial complex of like infographic, quote out of context of queer historical yeah. figure and then like mm. I, I don't know there's i think there's something really interesting there about time in the sense that queer figures historical figures get sort of like this is like the nerdiest example i could think of but the fate series of like uh where like uh, uh yeah, the fate series is like where basically you know, these like heroes they're removed out of time and they can be like summoned into any time period to like do things that's kind of like I feel like there's this like, oh, checkmate, like James Baldwin quote, I'm winning the argument that like, yeah. I think appears uh -huh. in like a lot of like queer cultural discourse. And I don't know, I would love to see someone play with mm. iconography or like voting. It's iconography. In a game. Yeah, yeah, it is. Like it's, literally. It's yeah. That yeah, go for it. Just do it. You go for it. Yeah. Yeah, iconography no, this, this in the religious sense, icon, right? Like, 
literal distillation of you know these these historical figures and and i think christopher what you're speaking to about like displacement the 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 idea of okay we're we're when you remove something from time you remove it from that historical context right and this this ties back to this idea of taking taking these these moments or these figures and and stripping them from that so that you can you know put somebody on a candle or a poster and and losing track of how that factors into all of the 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 political the social forces that informed you know who they are or, or how that fits into the world at large well, yeah you know, I, I think about this all you know as a, as a writer i think about this in in particular metaphors and for me it has always been the case that when i see things like this i i think about what it might be like to learn the the vocabulary of a language without learning the grammar or or to say another way that like when someone's someone who looks at someone like james baldwin and goes here is someone i relate to in my identity as a queer black man or as a gay black man or a bi black man whatever you whatever that person's identity is then they look for ways to use that relationship with baldwin and his work and what they have are the grammars of capitalism and what they have is the platform of etsy right um uh or you know contemporary internet drop shipping culture or grind set culture mm. or the the grammars that we've been taught for how to enunciate our feelings and who we are are really limited um there are particular pressures put on us to work as what we said before right there are market pressures uh, that exist that are that are when i say pressure i mean both um, incentive and pressure. I mean both, hey, if you want to make a living uh, as a queer artist, make your stuff consumable, make your stuff um, mm -hmm. easily digestible, make it um, uh, exciting for non-queer or non-marginalized people, um, make it cutesy, uh, or, or make it shocking in a way that will get you uh, you know, incredible media attention or, you know, play, play the field, make, a, get attention um, uh, in some way in that way. And uh, I think that that ends up being this thing that's like, there is space inside of the contemporary moment for us as uh, people who live, you know, I live in, I'm in North America, I live in the United States, I live in New York, to be safely out as a queer person um, and nevertheless have a lot of limits and pressures put on my work such that Sometimes without even thinking about it, I'm using the grammar of neoliberal capitalism, even when I want to make something outside of that space. Or the only way that you can pay your rent and still make queer art is to do it inside of those spaces. Or it's really easy to be like, hey, those student loans just kicked back in. You better you better get a job that can hit those, or your parents are getting older. If you want to make sure you can take care of them. All of those pressures that we exist under contextualize our decision making and often push us towards decisions and work that is, uh, you know, doesn't do a, a, ser a good service, does, it does a disservice to people like Baldwin or Rivera, who it's hard to imagine anything less them than the commercial votive candle or the Instagram quote drop, you know? I think the uh, this conversation actually, like, ironically kind of loops us back to the very beginning where we were talking about representation. And um, the votive candle, I, I think, is fascinating when i first came to canada everyone was telling me like you should, like i didn't know much about um race relations in canada and this was like 2018 and so everyone told me to read this book by sunara thumbani who is a colleague at, of mine at ubc um who wrote a book called exalted subjects and it's all about how like canada um sets things up to like exalt whiteness white maleness um and i think it was written like 20 years ago and so when i read it immediately it was the opposite in my in my mind i was like i think from what I've seen, what I've the advertisements I see, the way that um, people talk about blackness and indigeneity, it's actually the opposite. There's this exaltation of otherness that almost like allows permission to enter a room, right? First, you have to like do have a kind of exalty, worshipy kind of relation, like votive mm -hmm. candle kind of relation to otherness before you can then speak and and people will be expected to listen to you. And I find this is really fascinating games because there's there is this kind of form of representation that is so decontextualized and taken out of any kind of political radical like meaning. Um, and my favorite game for thinking about this recently has been um, Paradise Killer, 
which has the best theme song of almost any game I can think of. <laughs> um, and I can't listen to it anymore because it keeps me up at night because I'll just keep it in my head. Um, but Paradise Killer, like on its surface, it's about these like beautiful, gorgeous, sexy, like queer POC gods, like they're literal immortals um, who live on an island and are just kind of bantering and flirty and all this stuff. Um, and you're like trying to, it's a detective game, so you're trying to find the killer and all this. Um, but then the more that you learn about the context and the history, the more like effed up everything gets. <laughs> and there, there's no impact on the gameplay at all, the more that you learn about the history. And it actually, I had to like play it twice just to figure out what the actual context was. And what it is, is that you've, you as a, as a people, as this very small, campy, queer community, all diverse people of color, um, basically steal people from uh, Asians from their homes, force them to work, um, and in the most pain that you can possibly put them in, um, children, women, you know, everybody. And then you sacrifice them to this like immortal evil God. And you do this every like, like dozen years or something as you try to perfect the, uh, the, the types of sacrifice that you do. And again, you don't have to know any of this <laughs> to play the game. You just kind of find the lore scattered throughout. You find like children marking stones, like help me, you know, there is no heaven for us and stuff like that. Um, and I think like the, with the question of representation in games, like I, I feel like that is like such a deeply impactful like form of how we like seek to be represented or we seek like like this kind of um, uh, exalted kind of uh, empowerment narrative, right? And, and the background to it that exists, you know, that this can't be fun, diverse, queer group here um, are completely evil right and they're not, they don't they're so evil they don't even think about it it's so normalized right that they are complicit in this and they don't see these you know um, things as problems and we as players can play the game and take the exact same point of view like we don't have to I think there's one moment where somebody says like don't you realize you're the evil ones and the main character is just like no we're not and then you just move on <laughs> from that um oh here's my six-year-old son <laughs> coming so i'll finish there but yeah i like paradise killer for me like disrupts almost every narrative about representation that um, we seem to to hold on to so this is a bit of a half-formed thought but i guess i'm thinking about um the way that marginalized people uh like are dehumanized by way of reification or like by way of like being put on a pedestal or like being held to like uh, like a more exacting standard uh, or or that sort of thing. And uh, again, half form thought, but I don't know if that sparks anything for anyone. No, oh, absolutely, right? I mean, I think that there is a, um, I, you know, uh, for myself and the queer artists who I talk to the most, um, one of the things we, I think, spent a lot of time in the last few years feeling friction over was getting to tell stories about characters who are deeply imperfect, um, who are um, uh, frustrating, uh, who are irrational, um, and who are also queer. Uh, we want to tell those stories because we are frustrating, irrational, uh, sometimes mean, sometimes disappointing, um, uh, because we have people in our lives that are that. Um, but we also, especially if you're someone who is making work in for a broader context in a commercial space, there is this sense of, um, you know, one, will someone see me telling this story and extrapolate something from it that I'm not intending? You know, the work will hit the world and someone will read it as me saying that queer people are manipulative, right? Or, yeah, the actual thing that just comes to mind for me is actually not about queerness, but is about race. Uh, in Treachery and Beatdown City, the Sean Alexander Allen uh, uh, led game, Sean wasn't the only one making it, obviously, but Sean, very much Sean's baby. Um, there's this moment early on that I think about a lot where you uh, run into uh, someone who is not a dad who has not paid his child support, who's back on his child support payments. And when I hit that, I, it, this is a game that takes place in like a fictionalized New York City. It's filled with like real types of people, despite being a sort of dra a double dragon meet RP meets like Final Fantasy beat em up thing. Um, and when we hit this character who's like the black dad who's back on his child support payments, I was like, damn, that's real. Like, that's a real dude. And the second thought I had was like, I can't go on a podcast where I know I'm the 80% of the people who listen to me are white and talk about this in a way that's not for them. That Sean put that in that game for me. You know what I mean? And for us in a way that was like, 
that is um, a reality of living inside of black culture is the black dad who, and it's not like unique to black dads, obviously, right? But like we can talk about, Baldwin talked a lot about the state of fatherhood inside of black culture, right? Um, and I find that this can also happen with queer work where you can be making a story or making a, building a world or, or uh, you know, producing a game for, queer audiences. And when you're doing that, you're actually free to tell messier stories and more complicated stories because you know that the audience understands this, the place that you're coming from is not one uh, where you're making an exclusive judgment or you're saying, this is the limits of queerness. You're saying, yeah, this type of story happens in this space too. And um, where it gets really tricky is, and again, this is what I talk about when I talk about the pressures of the market. Suddenly you're making that game for, you know, suddenly you're making a character, imagine you're making a character not for Paradise Killer, but for Overwatch. What's the queer character you would put in Overwatch, a game that's going to be played by millions of people where you're not going to get long, extensive dialogue uh, and deep world building and all the other stuff that Paradise Killer has. And instead, you're going to get like a 12 page PDF comic and a two minute video about who the character is. Is that going to be your character who's going to be like queer and messy? Maybe they'll be gay and evil, you know, in a kind of campy way. <laughs> gay and like evil Disney. allowed. <laughs> gay and evil allowed. But like queer and messy. Mm -mm. much harder to get there in, in the big pro. And again, it's not, I want to be clear. I'm not saying like the sensors are going to come down and get you. I'm saying that there's actually a pressure put on you as a, the losing Guattari talk about uh, there's, there's a book uh, about Kafka called um, uh, towards, uh, Kafka towards a minor literature or something like that. And one of the things that they make, that they make the claim of early on is that uh, Kafka is writing as a German Jew in Prague. Uh, and those things Kafka can never not be a Jewish writer, even though he would never s sell himself in that way, because culturally the context that he's writing in pushes him into that space. And everything he writes will be considered Jewish writing, even though he's not selling himself or writing and, you know, the works of, of Kafka, a Jew, you know, like that's not what he's doing, but that is the, the way the work uh, works. And as queer creators, that is also a pressure that gets put on us and it shapes how we make stuff. Um, often in ways that I think limit us, which is a shame. But changes as we open up spaces like this, this is like the nice thing about something like this is, this is a community built where you can say, okay, hey, this is for us. You know, this is, this is we don't need, don't worry about limiting yourself in a way that where you're going to risk telling someone who has, who has you know, a bad faith engagement with your work to begin with, giving them ammo, right? You no, know, you go ahead and make the thing you want to make here in this space. And if it doesn't come out the way you want, you, you wish it came out, that's also okay, right? To go back to some of the stuff y'all were saying in the lead up uh, to, you know, what the what the jam is and the sort of um, positionality of, of it versus other jams, stuff like that, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is really interesting. Another point that, that came to me um, was the idea of like, queer death and like talking about about queer death in ways that you know there's a lot of I guess media history that people talk a lot about in terms of like queer characters being killed off but then also when there's a sort of pressure of the market to not have your characters killed off your queer characters killed off as a queer writer that stops you from talking it about sucks it sucks too right like yeah. you can't you know like, we know queer people who died, you know? Exactly. Like, I mean, I there, was, there were story. entire decades where death was was associated with queerness in, in, in real material ways. Yeah. Um, and it becomes difficult to talk about. Uh, and I think it's really good to have spaces that are for queer people for that exact reason, as you said, Austin. Um, so we have five minutes left. Uh, and I want to finish this off. I hope that you all take this question maybe really concretely. Um, so the question I wrote is, what does it mean and what might it look like to queer world building or to do world building queerly? What can queer ways of thinking bring to world building beyond the representation of LGBTQ plus characters of uh, thinking about beyond who's kissing who, as Chris put it at the beginning of the panel. And I think if we could distill that into maybe one or two like really concrete points for people who are about to embark on making a game. Um, and I'll start with Kavika. Um, I think I would probably just repeat some of what I said about Paradise Killer. <laughs> so, um, I mean, with, with Stamped, I tried to, I tried Austin's, you know, just talking about twos to try and 
um, introduce the mess kind of as much as I can. Uh, all the characters in Stamps um, are, they're not used to having power. You know, they come from very marginalized backgrounds um, in the US and then they travel to, to Asia and then suddenly they have all of this power, most of which they're not even aware of as Americans and, and partially because they've just never been in that position of power before. Um, and all of them misuse it in some form and have to then be accountable um, and and depending on the choices that player makes, try and take some responsibility perhaps <laughs> for the kind of BS that they've done, you know, projecting their dreams, desires, and anxieties onto Asian spaces. Um, and this is what happened to me in my 20s. You know, I went to Asia and had no idea how to deal with power, <laughs> how to deal with influence, how to deal with people smiling and then, you know, acting differently to other people around. And so that whole deal for me was just very illuminative and made all the violence and colonialism of the US and Asia very palpable. Um, and so for me, that is that is something that I feel like audiences are um, yearning for a bit more, especially in, in the less AAA scene, um, where again, in the AAA scene, they're all decontextualized. So. I think it's totally fine to make yeah. games about kissing, about cute people kissing each other. What I'd ask is like, what I what I push is, think about where they're kissing. Think about what it means if they were seen kissing, or what it feels like to be seen kissing. Think about what the uh, experience. You, if you're making a game in RenPy and you drop a background in there, what what's the background say about the kissing? How does it contextualize it? Imagine it's not a background but a foreground too. Um, imagine those people have to move through that background for real. Um, uh, in many ways, I think that that enhances the kiss. It, 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 if you can ground um, queer relationships in real places, in real concerns, in things like paying the rent or being out to one parent but not both, or um, being having a job that you, makes you feel complicit in the a state that is anti-queer fundamentally, um, uh, and nevertheless you elbow out room to reach out to someone, um, try to capture or try to explore some of that. Right? Um, it is hard to be queer. Uh, it's it's one of the reasons, and it and it's intentional to be queer. Um, you know, whatever we think about uh, attraction and gayness and self-expression and gender. Um, queerness is m more than what gender you are or who you like to hook up with. It is uh, an intentional posture you take towards the world. Um, and give yourself room for that posture. Give yourself room to like let your characters have some or fail to have some intentionality. But think about that and think about the, the fact that backgrounds are foregrounds too, right? The place where people are kissing is a place and it's not just a, a set on a movie studio. I think I'll piggyback off of something that Kavika said earlier. And Austin, I think this also ties back to what you were saying at the very start about bell hooks. You know, if we are defining queerness as a coalition of what exists outside of the norm, you know, outside of cis heteropatriarchy, then there can't be only one response to that driving you know hegemonic force like you know you you can't define queerness as existing only along one axis of marginalization and so recognizing that that room for messiness and that room for you know more leftist infighting so to speak like if you if you recognize that you know we as all have competing and, and conflicting you know we have visions of of what the queer future that we want to build are but they might not necessarily always be in alignment with each other and um, just like leaving leaving space for that multiplicity in that way oh man going last um i think i think that um we should have or think about how to represent queer feelings maybe like i feel like across the things that everyone else said there's this idea like i don't know not just queer joy but like queer frustration or queer, I don't know, hurt or longing or like all these other, I think about um, just like how in our quest to represent queerness perfectly in mass media, I think these like indie spaces are a great way to do so in ways that are more interesting, I think. That's my provocation. Make queer blue balls. I don't know. 
I love that. I think that's such a great note to end on. Uh, so, uh, so just to blue ball you a little bit, uh, we're gonna take a 20 minute break before our next panel. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists for this incredibly rich uh, and nuanced conversation. Uh, we're so grateful that you're here with us. Uh, and thanks for bearing with us through our tech difficulties at the start too, and for staying an extra 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I am really excited to see what this conversation sparks uh, along with our next panel. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, just just so lovely to be a part of this conversation and to, to see you all get the chance to talk to each other. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and we will see you all for the next panel, Queer Magic, in 20 minutes at 3 p.m. EST. Bye, Bye for now, folks. Hello, we are back. Um, or we are back except for Jess, who is just about to turn their video on. Hello, folks. <laughs> All righty, so this is our queer magic panel. Uh, and we are going to uh, start by introducing uh, our amazing guests. Uh, and the, the first bio that I see here in my little list of bios uh, is uh, Izzy Iqbal. So uh, Izzy is a multidisciplinary artist uh, focused on the intersection of games, theater, ritual, and magic. Uh, they can talk about games, mechanics, and interactions ad nauseum and are really looking forward to being on this panel. Uh, so Izzy, if you uh, just want to say hi to, to test your audio and... Uh... Okay, hi. <laughs> is it working? Okay. Yes. Great. Um, hi, I'm Izzy. Um, yeah, and I really love games and magic, which I think is why I'm here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Izzy. It's great to have you here with us. Uh... Google Docs is not cooperating with me. I will be. I feel like I can. File. I have it. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, next, we'll be introducing Rokashi. Uh, Rokashi is a Toronto based game designer and writer who recently started their own studio, Hedgehog Dreams, dedicated to creating games that focus on mental health and fun, cozy experiences. Uh, Rokashi, if you want to say hello so people can see you and hear you. Hello, 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 everyone. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, and it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Sharang uh, Bizwas. So uh, Sharang is an interactive artist, game designer, and writer. Uh, he has taught game design at Dartmouth, Fordham University, the NYU Game Center, and Parsons. Uh, from 2020 to 2022, uh, Sharang was game design artist in residence at the Museum of the Moving Image, uh, while from 2018 to 2020, uh, he was a visiting teaching fellow at the International Center of Photography in Manhattan. Uh, so Sharang has lectured about interactive art at institutions such as Columbia University, uh, DePaul University, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, and at festivals such as Games for Change, uh, the International Festival of Independent Games, which you might know as IndieCade, uh, and the Boston Festival of Independent Games. Uh, he showcased interactive works at venues, including the Museum of the Moving Image in Queens, uh, the M Manhattan Borough President's Office, the Toronto Reference Library, uh, the Institute of Contemporary Art, uh, and Pioneer Works in Brooklyn. Uh, Sharang has won awards for games from the International Festival of Independent Games, uh, the Ind Independent Game Developers Network, and the Any Awards. Uh, he's published essays in Eurogamer, First Person Scholar, and Kill Screen, while his fiction has appeared or is forthcoming in magazines including Strange Horizons, Lightspeed, and Fantasy. Sharang is the co-editor of a book that I love very much uh, called Strange, Lusts, uh, Strange Loves, an anthology of erotic interactive fiction, and Honey and Hot Wax, an anthology of erotic art games. Uh, 
He is currently a member of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Uh, Shrong, if you want to say hi. Hi, I wish I'd known the ratio of lengths between the bio I submitted and the other film because bio, because I feel a little foolish right now. But sorry, guys. I love that. <laughs> Uh, so you you may be wondering, uh, we have a fourth panelist listed, uh, Maddie Bryce. So unfortunately, due to a personal emergency, uh, Maddie won't be able to join us today. Uh, but uh, we are hoping that uh, if she's if she's available, we'll be able to involve her uh, in in other ways uh, as part of the jam. But we still have to uh, figure out what that'll look like. Uh, so uh, welcome. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, so the first question that we'd like to ask is sort of to give you the chance to introduce your work. Uh, so how do you see your design and scholarly practices in the context of rules, procedures, rituals, magic, and queerness? So in other words, for folks who might not know you, uh, please please introduce your work and, and the sorts of things that you like to think about. Uh, and uh, since I made this mistake last time, I guess I have to volunteer someone unless there's somebody who wants to volunteer. Thanks, Izzy. Um, okay. Uh, a lot of my work is fixated around sort of what I sometimes call like mundane magic. So this idea that we look at sometimes ritual as like a grand act of sets of rules and mechanics and these kind of grandiose things. Um, but I'm really fascinated in, in the idea of like, can something like drawing a card or a dice roll or simple actions? Um, and those are ones that are related to games, but even things like cleaning your house or like taking a sip of water. Can these individual actions be viewed as rituals? And what is the implication of that? Um, I think it's really fascinating that when we think about like skin uh, in the case of game. Um, and I'm really sad that Maddie's not here because a lot of her work has inspired the way I think about games and ritual. Um, she wrote about um, uh, tarot and Netrunner and this idea of can we view something like a Netrunner deck um, instead as a tarot deck? And how does reskinning the, the ritual that we're used to ch change? And how do these tiny details actually impact the small? So I like to think about a lot of these types of things. I guess when it comes to my work, um, I even in the lens of ritual, a lot of the games I design, I don't really have interest in publishing. And so oftentimes the only ways you can play them is to be with me physically. <laughs> and I think that there is something, I mean, obviously I think a lot about accessibility and I really wish I had the energy to, um, to propagate these more, but I think there's something really interesting about this sort of you are only experiencing this iteration of this game once, and the next time you play it, it probably will change the rules a lot. So um, things like that. Thank you so much, Izzy. Uh, I guess I could go next. Um, one thing that, especially you know, in terms of queer magic, the one thing that always inspires my work is always, you know, the thought of mental health and like, where are you in, you know, in a place where you create or design or, you know, you know, it's just like inspire um, other people to do the same. And it has really shaped my life in which that is kind of the only kinds of experiences I create. So with my, you know, with my first game, um, I'm fine. It was kind of like me trying to discover kind of like a fundamentals of like where I can take my growth in terms of person, like personality, and then like, you know, implementing it into my work. Um, but with my upcoming game, Far Away Fairway, coming out for the play date, I you know, like years later, um, being my second game, it just turned into something that, you know, I kept implementing things that inspired me. And yeah, like the biggest thing for me was mental health is considered magic to me. Um, it feels very powerful. It's personal. People can relate to it and understand it. Um, they like, you know, 
looking at it from the outside in, inside out. There's so many different moving parts to mental health and magic, and I feel like they're so intertwined. And I just want people to talk about it more. So that's kind of like where my work stems from. <laughs> that makes so much sense to me. Thank you. Um, and um, some of my some of the stuff I'm gonna say is actually similar to Izzy's, uh, but some stuff that I look at very much in games. I am actually giving a talk about this next week. Uh, I view games um, as the medium of art that um, prioritizes verbs, right? The things that we do um, and the procedures we engage with. Uh, and games are somewhat unique in that in that games allow us and force us in fact to assign symbolic meaning to verbs uh, that are endogenous to the magic circle right to the place space we're in that don't necessarily exist outside of the game and that in some sense is ritual right ritual is about the acts that we do and what meaning do they have what are the reverberations in the uh, perhaps like psychic space right of what we're doing so um in that way all game designers um, are creating ritual in, in that way, right? And perhaps I maybe do so more consciously in quote mark because I think about verbs very much when I do game work, uh, like what are the verbs present in the game, um, things like that. So, for example, I have a, a game from the National Academy of Science that I work on right now that we're very much looking into what is our teaching goal and what verbs support that teaching goal. It's not just a game where we're like, and now learn about blah, right? Um, so that's uh, one way uh, that I think procedures, rituals sort of like come together. And a lot of my, and talk about other topics, uh, queerness, like a lot of my games stem from ideas of personal experience, identity. A lot of my fiction writing actually stems from that as well, which is, you know, a very queer identity, uh, very queer, it's a queer identity. Uh, and so I think that is inescapably part of a funny thing. Four weeks ago, my dad was like, all your short stories about queer people. Why don't you write about normal people, right? And I, I don't want to be mean. My dad's first language is not English, so he just used the word normal because that's the word he's equipped with. But I remember being like, I mean, I may, I write stories about my own personal experience. And he paused. He's like, oh, that makes sense. And I'm like, right? Um, so yeah, so queerness, ritual, procedure. I don't know about magic. I mean, I write about magic, but I don't know how thoughtfully I engage with the scholarly topic of magic, but yeah. All, all engagement with magic welcome here, for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think I'm really excited to talk about the different facets of magic from the scholarly to like the playful. Um, and also thinking about like mental health as a form of magic is interesting. There's all kinds of forms of magic that are adjacent to queerness that I think we could talk about um through different kinds of lenses um so with that in mind i have a question uh oh also i wanted to know before i get into my question that you can always as we did with the first panel feel free to jump in and respond to each other to make it more of a kind of open conversation always you know like feel free to sort of move beyond the parameters of the question if there's something you find useful in each other's work um, we are happy to make this a kind of open conversation. With that being said, when people think of queer games, what comes to mind often first is representation. So games that feature characters and stories with LGBTQ characters and themes. Um, part of QGCon's project over the past decade has been to showcase games that imagine queerness on other levels, games with queer rule sets and procedural rhetorics or that uh, queer the concept of a game entirely. So what do you think it means to create a queer rule set? What is one way that we might imagine queerness in games beyond representation? Uh, Izzy, I'm going to call on you first. OK, I love this question. Um, uh, at an older QGCon, uh, Merrick Copas and Naomi Clark gave a talk on queer mechanics in games. It's like one of my favorite talks of like all time. And I did my own um, kind of sequential talk at UltraConf 2014 um, about queer mechanics in competitive video games. Um, so I love the definition here, which is that queerness is like, um, well, 
the metaphor that they use, and I might be butchering it because I like that was a while ago, but like that the idea is that like the status quo is like a bubble and queerness exists outside of it. So queerness in some ways is resisting the status quo and much like our identities that we're constantly fighting against something that's viewed as normal, just like the story that was just told about why don't you write about normal people because queer people are viewed as not normal. Um, and in that, um, so I, at this talk, I talked about um, Smash Bros. Melee, particularly, but like games in general, um, about how, first thing out, we were talking about glitches, right? That wave dashing and the competitive mechanics in Smash Bros. become, became the foundation of how the game was initially played and how this, this thing that was initially queer kind of became mainstream. And then within that, we, we started seeing other play styles that were queered off of it that were viewed as unfamiliar. And sometimes even um, when we come to like coziness, like just like using <laughs> kind of derogatory words to describe play styles because they're viewed as against this new status quo. Um, and how this was bubble was existing within that. And that was a way in which, um, um, the mechanics, in this case, the meta mechanics, are queered because they're existing in this space outside of the mechanics that were defined by the game itself. Um, there was a, a game designer made the intention about the, how the game was meant to be played and, and things that started to manifest outside of that. And that's something that, one, we can tie back to magic, and two, that we can tie back to queer mechanics, which is this idea that these things are are like existing above, they're they're almost invisible in a way, which is one of my favorite lenses, the idea of, of gods, which is something I want to get back to. Um, the next one is one, one of my favorite um, RPG systems of all time. It's called Die, as in Dice. Um, and uh, in it, every single world is a queered version of the, of the kind of commonplace roles. The idea is like, what if um, everyone hated bards, so they're dictators? What if um, the clerics um, had gods for pets, so they're godminders? Um, what if the like hackers were like weird, like no mages that were addicted to the currency they used to exchange with their weird fairy gods called neos? Um, this idea that that these roles themselves become the abstractions of what they're uh, initially referencing. Um, and thus the play of them becomes so different and dynamic and um, emotionally charged. I think that's the, the thing that I want to mention is that is that um, uh, there is an intersection of both like trauma and comfort that exists in magic a lot. And um, uh, in what, we're, what I was talking about, um, about like queer mechanics and competitive games, but also what I was talking about in this game, these two were like bubbling next to each other. And that I think is very much a queer experience. Yeah, if I remember the uh, panel with uh, Naomi and Merritt, uh, I, I remember them talking a lot about like glitch as a way of like accessing queerness in a way. So like, yeah, I, I, I could see how like the meta mechanics, so like the mechanics that exist on top of the, you know, um, prescribed game mechanics uh, and glitch uh, could have a lot to do with like, yeah, magic and like emergent surprising situations. It also makes me think about how um, in games like Super Smash Bros. Melee, where you have these sort of bigger communities that emerge beyond the game and also counter to the intentions of the game, right? Like the Melee community has survived numerous attempts by Nintendo to shut it down and cease and desist it out of existence. And when a community forms in that way that's kind of grassroots and autonomous, you also, you also gain people who whose intentions are beyond winning, like whose intentions go beyond the sort of prescribed like mode of success that the the game suggests for you. So there's people who just want to be a really good Kirby player, even though Kirby is yes. like technically a very bad character. Uh, you know, people who play off meta, but also people who who do that so that they can make friends who also play off meta. Um, different kinds of notions of winning and losing. That's a really, really interesting way to think about, about queer mechanics as well. I think, I think this brings this interesting, like, op not oppositional, but like these two ideas of queer play and queer design, right? Because Bo Ruberg in Video Games of Always and Queer has a number of chapters about playing a game queerly in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. And you were saying, Kaylin, I think I pronounced that correctly, um, about, um, playing a, a different sort of way. What does winning mean? Like Bo Ruberg talks about playing to lose, right? And like, and is that 
going against the like structure of a video game, right? In LARP and tabletop RPG is different because playing to lose is actually a concept that Nordic LARPers, for example, embrace wholeheartedly. But in video games, you could argue that yes, playing to lose is kind of going against the int design intention of the game itself. And that would be, that might be a, a mode of queer play. But Avery Alder, uh, who designed Monster Hearts that many of you in the audience uh, might recognize, I think is cited by Naomi in that talk, or at least in other talks about queerness that, that Naomi has given. Uh, and uh, Avery Alder has all these ideas about queer design. What, from the designer standpoint, can you do to make a game feel queer? Now, of course, you can get to the fundamental philosophical argument of, can you ever queer a game through design? Isn't queering about going against the design? Ah, but that becomes, that becomes very in the reeds, right? Uh, that becomes very epistemology, I guess. Um, but like, one of the ideas that Avery brings up that I really think about in this field is these ideas of, uh, uh, she, so she calls it, I think, the fruitful void, which is expanded on ideas from Vincent Baker and Ron Edwards. I know Naomi has also discussed this. I know Frank Lance has talked about the idea of the magic exists within the gaps of the game, right? But the idea that what, the, especially in tabletop games, what the design doesn't really address, but like kind of points to or dances around those gaps that players fill in are the gaps where queerness exists, right? And that makes me think of um, uh, Cruising Utopias, right? Um, Munoz writes about queerness as an act of becoming, right? And so these gaps that you as players fill in, um, not necessarily under the direction from the designer, becomes where you can bring in change and becoming and resistance and those kinds of like things. And that's where I think a lot of queerness um, lies. It's actually really funny, um, Izzy, that you brought up the uh, Smash Bros thing, because even for like for me, I've always played like sort of like unconventional characters in that game in a sense where like I play Jigglypuff and like I know Jigglypuff is like not you know necessarily one of like the best characters in that game but you know like it, it felt like like there's a very interesting uh connection when it comes to like queerness when it comes to like play and it's like you kind of want to you know choose create uh characters who kind of like feel like you know you would get along with they feel like you know they have like very similar personalities and stuff like that so it's very it's very interesting you say that because like that's something i always had like lingering in the back of my head whenever i play you know games where you know identify with like characters or you know certain personalities and i think that's very important especially when it comes to uh maybe not even like Care well, yeah, in some aspects like character creation, because like you think about how you want yourself to have a relationship with the character you just made, as well as you know how you want that character to portray themselves to you know NPCs, etc. And I know, you know, from like my personal experience, I know some people are like, well doesn't really matter what your characters look like but but to a lot of people that is like the core concept of why you want to create a character you know that looks a certain way so i think right. i like i think that should be celebrated i think more people should be um open to that sort of like mindset when it comes to uh queerness like magic and play because it like they're so intertwined when it comes to like creation uh of your, like your own vision and like mm -hmm. implementing that into a game i really love that idea right because like scott mccloud and understanding comics writes that one of the reasons comics are powerful for people is because they're the way that people are represented in comics are less photorealistic than in like film let's say which means you can put yourself into there more um, mm -hmm. And like, there's a lot of talk about like the, the we appreciate stories because we get to explore how that relates to us and our relationships. So I think Rakashi, your your point about like having visions of you is like really important, or not necessarily of you, but of what you want to be there. I think is really really important, right? So, 
Oh, so, so riffing off of this, what I wanted to ask is kind of a two-part question. One, do you think that character creators could be one of the gaps uh, that Sharang brought up? And you know, uh, poking poking at that idea, can can we intentionally create those gaps as designers, or does that run counter to the you know um, use those the unintended use of those gaps by by players to bring queerness into their play? Uh, yeah, like so sort of like can we design the gap and like if we do design the gap are we like what are, what are we doing to the idea of like queer play i guess I, I think character creators are so fascinating it's definitely not well because it's like this idea that that sometimes something that i feel like that we do as game designers is we tell our players like this is what you can do and this is what you can't do and so something I think that's so interesting about character designer is like, it's like the physical embodiment of like, this is what you can look like, and this is what you can't look like. And there's something so fascinating about that when it comes to appearance, because um, queerness and appearance is I think one of the like, one of the like top level ones where it's like, it's so easy, it's so easy to, appear queer maybe i guess is what i mean to say is like because there's there's some we identify something as like this is what normal people look like and then we're like oh like a second that you you to start to twinge any of these tiny details you you clear that and i think that's something so fascinating when it comes to the character creator is because this is like the one aspect where we as players get to go this is the way i want to look in this world and in some games you're like you get to be man one and woman two and in some games they're like you can do it i mean more on you it's more on you but like you can look you can have any organs or hair color or thing that you want like go wild but even within that um kind of this is like <laughs> like kind of like a, a person like Baldur's gate like right i'm like yeah i can look like anything i want but like why can't my warlock type be like with a frog like this this idea that like like the, in enabling this one element of it and the focus of that perhaps in development um this idea that when it comes to D and D creativity when it comes to mechanical diversity where it's like okay i can say my character looks like all these things but i want my, my i want my finding drive to be that i want to drink juice in the morning like that's like that's what wakes me up like and and how these games sometimes don't let you do stuff like that um paolo Perrucini has a really lovely talk from indicate from a number of years ago called uh, video game the spirit of capitalism and he talks about how the video game form is the like aesthetic crystallization of the rationalist philosophy right because by being uh things that are made of lines of code of lines of logic uh, a video game becomes an artistic representation of rationalism, inescapably, he argues, right? And so I'm going to put my analog game designer bias hat on and say, yes, it is impossible then in that case for video games to allow you to be like completely queer in that way, right? Uh, uh, Izzy might be like, I would like to have a warlock that has a pact with a frog, but then someone else might be like, I would like to have a warlock that has a pact with a red-tailed boa constrictor. I made that up, right? Uh, and obviously, no video game is going to be able to cover all those bases, um, which is where analog games come in, and their superiority shines, right? Uh, <laughs> because if Izzy's in my game and says, I would like a frog warlock pack, I'd be like, excellent, let's go for it. And here's your juice in the morning, right? Um, so I think that that's one part. But the other part about the putting in the gaps, I think also echoes what Izzy says, right? Because you intentionally decide what to put in and what to not put in. Um, most adventure game looking at baldur's gate 3 do not make you pee every hour or poop every day right like that is not in the rules imagine going to fight orcs oh wait i have to pee can we take a pee break quickly right that is in it might be it is intentional right it, it might not be deeply thought but that's because of you know hegemony of play and all that we we think of ways that games exist so we don't even consider these alternatives but that is still an intention someone has to program whether or not you pee or you don't pee right uh, and so if we can be more thoughtful about that that we absolutely can put in those gaps even in like video games and in analog games very often games are extremely intentional about 
what they decide to define and what they don't decide to define, right? Uh, think of like uh, uh, John Harper's Lasers and Feelings, right? Which is the one page role playing game that's very well known. Um, there are all these like elements and things, but John Harper does not define them, right? Or in his more famous Blades in the Dark, he has all these world elements and setting elements, and oh, there are there's the moon and the seven dimmer reflections of the moon, and like all these things are hinted at in the book, but he does not define them and leaves them up to players to define, and he does that on purpose, right? Uh, I know that because I've asked him about this, um, and. I think so. I think it is the job of the game designer to intend to design gaps. And sometimes those gaps find their ways in. Uh, and sometimes you can be can sit and be like, what am I going to let players make and not make? So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I like to think that, especially when it comes to you know character creators, I think one thing, like as much as you get to, you know, pretty much do whatever you want. I think there is also some kind of power in limitations as to like in the context of like, if you, if you know, you create this magical character that feels like you, um, looks like you, uh, maybe even like talks like you, you, if it like that kind of like supports it, but even with a limitation, and you're playing in this sort of like fictional world, I think not being able to do something, I don't know, it feels more real to me. I think I think it's okay to have, you know, a player in a world like that feel like they can't do anything. Because when you have, you know, a character in a world that could do anything, it's just like, where, like, where do you go like where do you go from there? You know what I mean? It, like it feels This is why I don't like open world games. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it it's it's so interesting because like I because like I think about that when like when I'm designing games, like I want characters to explore, but like don't explore too much. Like do you do you really have to? Like like what's what's in front of you right now? Like is that more important or is it you know what passed you by so it's like it's a lot of like questions that make uh, a lot of players have to like think about how they navigate through uh a space or like a game and i think i think you know having that sort of mentality in mind when creating is also uh pretty fundamental i think that's really cool Am I talking too much? I keep responding. No, <laughs> no, no. Um, I think Rakash's point is really interesting because the converse can also be very illuminating, right? Uh, about what do you show that most media like elides, right? I was thinking about there was a Hindi movie I watched many years ago, and I read a review about it, and the reviewer talked about how you know what never gets shown in movies where women have children where people have children, the afterbirth, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know what the afterbirth is because our media representations of pregnancy and birth never show that, right? Um, I was at a LARP this summer in Copenhagen uh, called, um, oh my God, the name's escaping me, I just played it, it's really good. It's called House of Craving, which is a LARP about a family, the mother has just died by suicide, they go to this lovely vacation, home kind of thing to try and sort all their feelings together. And then the ghosts of the house drive them into incest and madness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in the LARP, in our workshopping, because extensive workshopping uh, before the LARP began, um, the, the LARP is about sex, right? A lot, one of the major things, it's not the only thing to LARP's about, obviously, but sexuality and desire and problematic desire is a, a big theme in the LARP. And the, the, the desi designers and facilitators were telling us when you do sex scenes, uh, don't forget the like messy and awkward parts that come with sexuality. One of the examples, uh, he gave a couple examples. One example is like, oh yeah, you hook up with someone and then the thing they said reminds you of the dead mother. Bring that up. Bring that up in the middle of the sex scene. <laughs> or like, okay, you just, you just had sexual intercourse. Great. Pum is now going to leak out of your butt. Like, what are you going to do about that, right? Those are the kinds of things that often get avoided in other media depictions. Like, everyone knows, right, watch a gay movie, and they're like, wait, they're banging now? What? Has he, 
what? Like, and it's <laughs> spotless and clean and, I, and it's comfortable for everyone. Like, seriously? Um, what? Um, right? But in this game, they were like, no, no, we want you to pay attention to those details because those that are, that are often gaps in other places, the, the, the def defining and realizing of those forces us to think about these things, these acts of sexuality in this example, in ways that other media does not. And and then is that a way of querying? Is that a way of becoming and thinking differently about established um, modes of representation? I think so in that in that lens, I think that there's so many um there's so many fascinating, especially analog games, like D and D systems. I think Die is one of them. Um, another one I noticed is the Alien RPG system. Is where, and this is why I'm so happy that Rokashi is here. Is that is from the idea of comfort, right? Is like, we're, is this game? These games ask you to terrorize your players, but you're 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 playing games with your friends, and so like you're like asked to like to like to something that they do and that they have a full success but then you still punish them somehow because there's like i think one aspect is like you know the grossness of sex and a lot of these games it's like the grossness of murder and like what is it what does it mean to do these acts and so we look at a game like grand theft auto where you can just like accidentally hit someone's car there's like there's like such little like world repercussion it's like you just like kind of go on your way whereas in these games every like Every time you do acts like this, it not only because sometimes it has a mechanical repercussion. Sometimes you you are forced to be to have this thing described to you, right? Um, one of my favorite intros of the of the of the of the, of the game is it, it mentions this idea of like a death touch, and it's like viewed as such like a binary state, like I touch you and you die. But the way it's it's shown in the comic and the way that you're asked to describe it is it's like kind of rending the flesh off of someone, and it's like awful and disgusting and so every time your players are motivated to do this you almost punish them with the repercussions of their actions from a narrative perspective um and and the idea in that is that you're almost motivating this player to like never use their powers because they like always have awful effects um i think i think that that idea is so interesting is because i guess this is come back to the idea of comfort is that the, such an important thing in tabletop systems is establishing the magic circle and and defining things that you do do not want to talk about um and how that's interesting because there you're almost kind of prefacing this idea of like yes i want you to torture me this way but not in that way and sometimes that contract is defined by you actively engaging in playing a game but then of course it's like, can we? Can all games be upfront about the, the ways in which they want to punish you? Mm -hmm. I kind of want to um, also mention because this, I think this happens sometimes. Like at this in this panel, we're talking about very like expansive definitions of queerness and how we can academically and artistically engage with that uh, in ways that are beyond just representation, but. For audiences who might look at this later, I also still want to reiterate that this does not mean that representations of queerness are not important anymore, right? Like mm -hmm. it, like like I I just want people to remember that, like a thirteen year old boy who is wrestling with his gender or or, or sexuality is going to be empowered by looking at representations of queer people. They're not necessarily going to look at a piece of media and be like is this an act of becoming in a way that is non-normative, right? They also need just like, let's have like trans people and gay people and bisexual people and asexual people shown on screen in a positive light. So I just wanna, for our audiences, mention that. Absolutely, yeah, that makes so much sense to me. Uh, you know, um, yeah, I think, I think when we're very steeped uh, in this environment, we're like, we take that for a, a given, but it's so important to say. Um, I want to bring this back a little bit to the idea of uh, constraints uh, and rules. So, you know, um, in 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 queer games, like you know, in 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 this area that that we all sort of inhabit a little bit uh, at different times and in different ways, there are lots of queer creators uh, who've made games that are deeply personal uh, and autobiographical, like representations of of themselves. Uh, so board games, tabletop games, LARPs, and rituals uh, all commonly feature, you know, sequenced, standardized uh, instructions. Uh, and so, like, thinking about from the pr perspective of, like, rules and constraint, uh, but also, you know, generative constraint, uh, like, uh, like I think Rakashi uh, mentioned, um, 
what could it look like to incorporate the idea of like the personal or personalized uh, ritual uh, into game jars that traditionally lead to uh, lean towards uh, standardization? So you know, um, uh, you've already mentioned like very richly that like you know in in RPGs uh, in particular, tabletop games, you have the freedom to to break the rules and to like live in those gaps where you can you know. Be be connected to a frog as your as your warlock patron, uh, and drink all the juice. Uh, but yeah, so like uh, Izzy, yeah. you started a meme. This is gonna be a thing. <laughs> I I know what my next character is, you know. Uh, but yeah, so so yeah, like how could we incorporate like the personal or personalized idea of ritual? I guess when I was thinking of this question, I was thinking of of all of you, but particularly, I would love for Izzy to to start us off. Okay, so I. <laughs> So I, I, the first time I played Breath of the Wild, I like brewed that guy, the game up, and I was like, I'm gonna be a vegan. And so I, I put this in this like personalized rule on myself that I like wasn't gonna consume animal product or meat or I guess monster in this in this. <laughs> instance. And 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 I wanted to finish the game with this construct. And then like we had this moment where we were like healing and like we ate an egg and we were like, fuck, and we like reset the game and we like started over. But um, but this idea of like this idea of, like a person this personal. Right. So the game told me the way I wanted to be played. It told me healing items up like this. It told me like actually like to make my character stronger in certain instances, I have to rely on these monster potions, which I was arguing to myself were not vegan. <laughs> so I could not use these mechanics. And this is a this is a personal thing I put upon myself. Um I love that how this comes back to ritual, right? I've now formed this really personal connection with my playthrough of Breath of the Wild, which emanates in me telling the story to you, um, but also in the play itself and how it changed how we how I viewed things like the wildlife. Like one time I accidentally shot an arrow and there was just a wolf, like a fox hiding in the in the brushes. I didn't see it. And so this arrow f flew and they have such comedic deaths. So like it jumps in the air and like poofs into me. And I was like, okay. Uh, hmm. And and under normal circumstances, I think that would just be viewed as the regular game loop. But for myself, I suddenly viewed that as a transgression with this, this this religion I created with the game, which is that I told myself I was going to be vegan, and now I have to suffer the consequences of this action. Like, what does this mean? What does it mean to kill the fox in in Breath of the Wild? So, I I think. I think when it comes to like the more standardization thing. So um, like what Kashi was talking about, I competitive games for my bread and butter. And at a certain point, I started playing these types of characters because I like I like I played Sheik because I wanted to be like a gender bending princess that turned into like a badass ninja. Like I that uh, that made sense to me and I wanted to be that. But then I started to really um codify with the mechanics, right? I the character's fast. The character real the character has lots of like forward style aggression the character has weird teleporting moves like i it, it fit with my personal place out of the thing and maybe that maybe that is magic maybe that's coincidence um uh, i started to play netrunner which is the game i mentioned i mentioned earlier and then it became it became my mo to sometimes make weird decisions in the game that were not viewed as as popular or like even good or so at that point I mechanically expected because at this point I was sitting at a at a high table I got there I made a decision that was weird why and then that sort of created that meta layer of like the, is there a bluff is there something more to this and in some ways that's like that's queerness in itself right this idea so my at this point it's almost like the rules create the sort of transitory state between the player because the player can accept or deny these rules. And what does that mean for for the system as a whole? And what does that mean for the person? Mm -hmm. uh, Rokashi, mm -hmm. I guess I'm thinking of like um, coziness and cozy games in the context of like a daily ritual or, you know, um, you know, uh, there are lots of cozy games out there. But when I think of cozy games, I think of like, Pending and like sort of ritualized like schedule almost in a way. So I guess I'm curious uh, if that uh, evokes anything for you. It's really interesting that, I mean, especially for that question, it's very interesting because I actually started playing uh, Unpacking. Mm -hmm. I and just there... assigned that to my students. <laughs> it, it is, it is such a it's it's incredibly bizarre because it's like it's so 
calming in a way where you just like the whole game is just you're just putting things away but like when i first started playing it i'm just like okay well this book goes on the shelf this this goes here but when you start thinking more about you know the story behind the items that you're putting away it, tell, it begins to tell a story that I feel like not I don't I don't I haven't really seen a lot of people like talking about that but like you put things away and like uh it's very interesting because you're just like where is you know where is this character coming from where are they going and you see how like they progress and it's very I know it just hit me in a way that just made me think of how we you know we deal with uh just like space within a game where you have to do like the same thing over and over again but then there's so much power in what you're doing over and over again so it's kind of like that sort of like repetitive nature kind of like i don't know it kind of like bounced itself back on me where i'm just like what do i do over and over again like how do i like process things that I do every day and it kind of like built itself up into you know some sort of I don't know like I it's still like a journey for me but like mm -hmm. I think it's very important for people to play a game or you know have some sort of mentality where they go into a game to be like what am I doing why am I doing this and what's the story behind everything like what's the end goal or even like how did we get here? You know what I mean? It's like, there's so many questions that you kind of like want to find that out through, you know, explore, ex exploration, play. And I just want to see more games like that, especially in like a cozy sense. So yeah, like I, I just love that. And I just want more, more like that. So like, I want to do kind of like that for my own games, for myself. Uh, Yeah, but I think there's a lot of power in you know, doing the same thing over and over again, but having more meaning behind it. Yeah, there's a way in which those moments in isolation, uh, they don't mean anything. But, you know, when all of a sudden there are two pairs of shoes uh, that you're unpacking and they're in, like, very different styles or, like, there's, like, oh, now now we have, like, you know, there, there's a story unfolding that's not legible from any one moment in like the daily ritual of unpacking or like the repeated across the years uh, movement in a game like unpacking that becomes legible through like the, the repetition, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Sharang, is there anything that you would like to add about uh, maybe ritual and the erotic uh, or the erotic game or uh... I mean, I actually have thoughts about this idea of the personal personal and solo stuff because I think Rakashi's example of unpacking is really is extremely interesting in that the game is fairly linear in its ultimate narrative design, right? Like there are like what seven, eight levels, I forget how many and the start and end point of them are kind of the same in some ways, but the gameplay is extremely personal, right? There is no correct answer for except for like one or two objects, like can't just go anywhere. But otherwise, you can you have all this freedom to whatever you want, right? And I think that's a really powerful area of the like personalization, right? Where <clears throat> excuse me, even if the like end points are known, the fact that you can you have room within the space to navigate and do your own thing is an extremely um, empowering sort of thing. So I'm thinking of, I always talk about TTRPGs, that's my speciality, right? Uh, but I'm thinking of uh, a game like Bluebeard's Bride, right? You might know it, it won an Indicate Award, it won a bunch of awards, mm -hmm. it's, it's really epic. Uh, it was, there was a GDC talk about it, not last year, the year before last, right? Um, so Bluebeard's Bride, you start the game with the GM telling the table the folk tale of Bluebeard and basically telling the table, we're gonna recreate this now. So we know the ending, right? We know what's gonna happen, the sticky ending, right? The bride is not gonna be uh, happy at the end, right? And then you play that game, but the joy of the game is not in 
oh, what's the, what's the ending going to be, right? The joy of the game is how do we get to the ending? And perhaps more importantly, how do we feel about getting to that ending, right? Um, Rakashi talked about these constraints. And here, the narrative constraint of this is the story allows for extremely interesting, nuanced, thoughtful explorations within those bounds that I think, like, for me, uh, I wrote an article about Lubia's Bride being a game about uh, domestic violence, right? Intimate partner violence. So it allows us to explore that theme very um, well. And I've, I have run Bluebeard's Bride as a game, as a GM, uh, 15 to 16 times at this point. Uh, and each time, the ending is going to be one of like three endings where the, the terrible things happen to the bride. It's never happy. There's no happy ending. And yet, the uh, explorations within keep intriguing me, right? Uh, similarly, games like Ten Candles by Stephen Dewey at the end of Ten Candles, the world is destroyed, right? All humans die at the end of every game of Ten Candles, right? And yet, the fact that you know that there's going to be this death perhaps gives the actions, the personalized actions you do, even more meaning because that is what remains, right? You will remember those, the ending, you're all gonna die. Um, and I think that's a really uh, interesting um, idea of like personalizing and ritual and because you know, yeah, so mm -hmm. convoluted thoughts, sorry. Yeah, I think the idea of restriction, of queerness as being in restriction instead of in possibility is really compelling. Um, I I actually have been like writing an, an article recently that. Um, it's not out yet or anything, but that thinks about GB Studio, like the game engine, um, as a kind of like queer pleasure where mm. you, um, you know, we think of, like I said, we think of queerness as a kind of possi open possibility. And when we approach digital game making in that way, like you said, like there's no way to make a kind of infinite possibility game. And game engines like to promise this, like Unity and Unreal, they like to promise these kinds of like open, expansive places of sort of creative possibility. And then the reality always kind of sucks because like there's this interface that you have to get through that's like really annoying. And then there's, you know, all the stuff that happened with Unity recently. Um, and then if we rethink of queerness in terms of restriction and working within constraints and sort of like consenting to being restrained in a certain way, right? Um, and doing what we can within that space. And thinking about game engines like GB Studio, which for people who don't know is like a sort of small game engine that produces that that produces games only for the Game Boy Color and that works within the sort of technical restrictions of the Game Boy. Um, and that actually produces games for that, like they'll produce cartridges um, that you can play on the original hardware. Uh, create kinds of spaces of like technical restriction that you can have sort of pleasurable interactions with. Um, so I think restriction is a really, really productive way to think about about games and the kind of the, the sort of rule systems um, as a kind of restriction that you that you submit to and work through and, and push against. Um, but I wanted to maybe move on to a darker side of magic uh, to bring us back to the topic of the panel. Because magic, as much as it can be liberatory, can also be kind of a touchy subject in queer spaces. On the one hand, the way that magic centers emotional and bodily forms of knowledge and the figure of the magic user as someone who blends and transcends gender and social norms, these aspects are obviously appealing to queer imaginations. But magic and witchery have also been appropriated in trans-exclusive spaces um, and by bigoted creators who use the idea of bodily knowledge to deny rights and self-determination to trans people. And magic has also been appropriated, I think, by fascists, by esoteric fascists who use the symbolism of magic to propagate raci racist notions of purity, power, and nostalgia. So how can we, this is a lot of big, big, dark questions, right? And I guess, how can we reclaim magic for queer and trans liberation? It's my my main question about that. Um, and I actually don't want to volunteer anybody. I can go. I'll go. go um, please. I love talking. Just kidding. Um, so I think you're not kidding, Izzy. None of us in this space do not love talking. <laughs> um, I think that I think that 
something that's really interesting about about magic um, is this idea that there's like light and dark magic, baneful and boonful magic, and um, the I, the notion of evil certainly or darkness certainly gets questioned a lot. Um, and a game I love for this, which is funny because I like never played it. Why don't watch people play it? Um, Bayonetta, where it's this idea where it's like like the umbral witch is actually kind of the the hero and she's fighting against like these like christian like weird like biblical nightmares because that's how they're described and 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 this idea that like though this perhaps this discipline is is um is powered by pain and torture and kink and this other discipline is powered by like worship and light and uh, love uh the the actors in that in that space they're using those abilities for oppression for denial for for fascism um and this and this idea that it, it sometimes form becomes a little less um important as much as intention becomes important um in die the dictator is I, this idea that is a is a character that can tell you to do whatever they want um and in the in in the a certain point around the the game is very consent focused so in like the consent blurb around the character they're saying like like you really need to think about what it means to like have total authority and control over another person and if you were to deny this person a certain amount of like bodily autonomy and this is in the lens of like sexual assault like not not only is this like really like fundamentally incorrect like you shouldn't let a player that's like this even like inside your house like it's like talking about this idea that like that the idea of total like control like like there be fascism i think it, like for me it always comes back to fascism like like this idea that like Magic can sometimes be, sometimes I think that magic and religion are like on the same wavelength. And so it's like religion is this idea of like magic kind of co-opted to control people and ritual and, and other lenses is, is can be like viewed as personal and healing. Um, I, I think when it comes to queerness, I think this is something that we were talking about. We're, we're, we're essentially framing in these different sets where it's this idea that we're, we're given systems and we're allowed to have choices within these systems that are personal to us. We can say yes to these parts and no to these parts. And within the play, either the play cadence like doesn't move forward because <laughs> like you can't progress, but you as a player get to go like, this is all I'm doing. Or the play press pro progress because you, you create, you take the decisions that it asks you to do. I really argue that when it comes to queerness, and ritual and magic is it, it really becomes this idea of like personalization. I, as I started my own magic practice, um, I really struggled with the idea of deity um, because I was I was raised Muslim. And so this idea of deity felt so interlocked. The idea of defying it felt it would be met with like being what's the smoten smited like like being like conflagrated smitten works right <laughs> yeah and and so the idea of like angering this like higher power but as i started to learn i realized that all of these like witches and mages and folks i were talking to had such varying different practices than each other and respected that of each other they were they did not view that as um transgression and i think that became the the ultimate theme is that the ultimate themes come back to these ideas is who wants to be fascist and who doesn't <laughs> yeah i think it's really interesting that you brought it up at like all these you know these different kinds of people who have you know that sort of magic kind of like do their own thing with it and there's always going to be you know like you know, one group of people who you, you know, like they use it for like very like bad intentions or whatnot. And then like others will like good, but it's just like, sometimes it makes me feel like, like where does like, is there like what kind of like balance is there between the two? And like, what does the middle ground look like? Like who, who are the, you know, people who use that sort of magic in the middle ground? Like where, 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 do, where do they look? You know what I mean? It's, it's very interesting. Uh, to come from that side, and I don't know, like I, and I'll, I'll still like I'll say it again, like I, when, I, when it comes to like magic, I always think of it as like like mental health. So like if I, if there's like sort of like you know like a dark magic, it's just like what kind of 
you know, experiences did that person go through in order to have those sort of like negative thoughts or feelings or actions and stuff like that. And it, it, I don't know, it, it kind of like, I don't know, maybe it's just, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but like, it kind of creates some sort of like empathy as to like why, you know, I just had like a, you know, like a moment where it's just like, whoa, <laughs> it's just like, like, why, like, how, how do you get, how do you get to that point? You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 it like, it makes me think, I get, like, I get lost in thought a lot, just like thinking about how people get to a point where all their intentions are just bad. Like, what, like, how do you, like, how do you explore that with uh, people who just continue to do bad things? And you just want to know, like, is there a way, like, is there, like, redemption behind that as well? Um, so those are the kind of things, like, I think about when I think about, like, like good or, like, bad magic. It's just, like, where does it come from? And, like, where does it go? And, like, the people who who use that energy, like, what what do they do? Like, where, what do they experience? And I think that's a very interesting sort of like question to consider uh, or even like think about when someone like mentions it. Cause I think that's also very important for people to, to actually have like that context behind it. So it's just like something could be bad or someone could be saying like, Oh, you're doing a bad thing, but it's just like, is it bad? Like, what exactly makes like inherently makes it like a bad thing so it's like i feel like there's a lot of like nuances uh, i i think I, obviously it gets really tricky at that part because like there's so many you know branching uh part and moving parts to it so i think it's something that we should definitely think about i think it's something that people should be very mindful of uh especially uh when it comes to queerness because you know, there's so many, you know, different kinds of people out there who experience different things. Uh, they show themselves uh, in a very specific way because that that feels like them. And I feel like... I feel like if someone were to say, oh, you can't, you know, look a certain way or dress a certain way, like, I would consider that, like, bad magic because you are taking away, uh, you know, someone's energy from them when, you know, being who you are is, like, supposed to be something that is celebrated and, like, something that should be, like, more of a positive experience. Uh, yeah, it's something I think about a lot, actually. <laughs> Just, like, magic in general, but, like, it, there's so many moving parts to it, but I don't think, like... Like, I don't think... I don't know. It's still something I like. I'm ongoingly think of, thinking about, but yeah, like I, it, it's it's a lot. <laughs> I like to think about games as contracts, and so in some ways, when we play a game together, we like have this contract where it's like we kind of agree to these rules that are like in the book or like coded in the game, and and at any point, if we decide that this contract isn't working, you technically are allowed to opt out. Right, you're allowed to go. Okay, I just I don't want to play with you anymore. I think one of my favorite ones is I like to view capitalism as this like fucked up game that we all have to play, right? And so it's like that's where it gets really struggled because it because it's like you still have to play, but you can't play this way, right? And so you you yeah. without getting too much into it, like how do you opt out of capitalism? Yeah, <laughs> like and so I think that's that's what's interesting is it, is it, and when it comes to religion is this, in a lot of these instances like. I did not have the option to be not Muslim growing up, right? And so then all these systems I'm forced to interact with because I had no opt out. And so I think that's something that's really interesting is it's like it's like what it's the ritual of forcing a game onto someone that they don't want to play because there's parts of the elements that they don't agree with or that don't serve them. I I find Izzy's example of um, Bayonetta to be. I mean, I find I'd be like that because if we're thinking of this idea of how do we stop um, unsavory actors from co-opting our like symbols, right? Because at some level you could think about like a magic and magical practice as systems of manipulating symbols for our own like whatever we want to do, right? Um, I, I, it makes, I, I like the Bayonetta example because 
Um, Izzy underlined how it's showing this like non-normative depiction, right? Like, oh, the light and the ze zealous paladin-like people are the bad guys, and you, the darkness and stuff, are the good guys, right? Um, and I think that that is these example is one way we have to combat this kind of co-opting symbols, right? Because so Antonio Gramsci, right, a Marxist thinker, writes about how um, hegemonies maintain ascendancy by controlling what is considered the norm or what is considered common sense, right? Um, oh, of course you don't dress like this if you have a penis because that's not the norm that's why would you do that that's incomprehensible to do right that's an example of how a hegemony maintains power uh, by exerting that influence right and so to combat that we have to break what is considered common knowledge common sense right through queer art right through queer depiction through discussions about how the norm can be challenged, how queerness can be allowed to exist, how we can change and exist in these potential spaces and these possibility spaces, we, I think at least, and of course this is caveat that I am an artist, so I believe in the power of art, as all of us do, I'm guessing, right? Um, I really think that that we have, like, this is obviously there's slow methods and other methods and fast methods and, you know, violent methods and things. But this is one way in which you break the power of hegemonies by making people confront other depictions, right? And so if symbols are being, again, this is not, I'm not an expert in this, but if symbols are being co-opted, one way of doing this is to put our own art out there, right? The, the big example of this that's sad, I remember when I was in grad school, the first day I met this lady who became a co-collaborator of mine for years, I mean, still, and she um, had a, uh, a, a Norse elder Futhark tattoo. Uh, and we were, and she is um, biracial, right? She's half Korean. And I remember talking to her about how sad it is that white supremacists have co-opted an entire mythology that belongs to the world, right? Like an entire like Norse mythology has been co-opted by white supremacists as their symbol. And I'm like, that's so sad, right? Is this how can you co-opt the entire mythology, right? And so that's an example of what the question, right? Uh, and I think the way we defy that is by showcasing counterexamples and and questioning, like when we talk about. Oh, like Loki is a gender fluid character who like changes gender and things all the time, right? Or sillier example of how Thor, at least in the Marvel version, has become a lesbian icon for some reason, right? Like all these like counter sort of examples and, and non-normative depictions through art, I think are a way we can counteract the like uh, co-opting of our symbols by um, fascist agents and things like that. So I I sort of want to tie this back together uh, briefly between Rokashi's sort of idea of like the everyday magic of mental health and like everyday practices and like uh, the way that, you know, the norm is made up of a series of like daily moments and daily representations in a way uh, to think of how, I guess, uh, you know, um, there's an everyday magic in the ritual of like showing up and being counted counter to the status quo or or the norm uh maybe um so jumping off into a completely different direction but maybe not where we we've, we've been circling around some of these topics uh we have creators here on this panel uh one of whom is wearing you know a space silver pup t-shirt right now uh who work with queer eroticism uh, as a key theme uh, in their works and we also have creators uh, who work with themes of coziness. And I think we've done a good job of bringing together how both of those things uh, have something to do with like, uh, you know, uh, ritual and practice and like daily, uh, you know, daily things. Um, and I don't think that these, these two themes like eroticism and coziness have to be at odds, but the cozy game genre has been criticized for sort of shying away from more complicated uh, or negative emotions and experiences. And then on the other end, and queer sexuality, eroticism, and kink uh, are often considered, you know, objectionable uh, and offensive by some. So, with that in mind, I sort of want to ask, like, about 
putting these ideas side by side. So juxtaposing coziness and eroticism. So what are some of the things that are or could be cozy about queer erotic games? And what are some of the ways that queer cozy games can evoke or be compatible with erotic game experiences? So what kinds of intimacy uh, do you all think we could build uh, by bringing these kinds of themes together uh, in the larger context, I guess, of, of the themes of this panel? I, I guess I could speak to that a little bit. Um, in terms of like, you know, coziness and eroticism, I think, I think they go hand in hand <laughs> a lot of the time. I think they're, I think to a certain extent, they're inseparable. They feel almost the same. It just, you know, sort of like depends on, you know, your experience with the both, with both of them, I think, or even just one. I feel like with one, you still sort of find your way to the other. That's how close they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like there are a lot of games out there where you're always playing one or the other, but like you would play a game and you feel like something is like sort of like missing from that experience. And usually that is what it is. Like you're not necessarily getting that. Uh, if there is a game that, you know, that does both very well, uh, I would like to hear it. <laughs> I, I, I like, I want to, I want to be able to like, you know, experience that, you know, and be like, this is what people should be playing. This is what, uh, we should be talking about more. This is this is what we should be discussing and showcasing, especially when it comes to queerness, because we want people to, you know, understand, you know, everything about, you know, what we do, uh, how we speak, how we, you know, educate ourselves or each other. And I think that when it comes to coziness, which is more. I don't want to use the term like PG thirteen because that, but like that is sort of like kind of like the idea how you 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 know view coziness uh, in media. I guess it's just like it's very PG thirteen. But I feel like there are also bits and pieces of eroticism in that coziness within itself, but it's not inherently described. But I feel like once you explore through that coziness, you will eventually get to it. But I do think that it needs to be uh, showcased both because that, that gives it more power. I think, I think the fundamental misunderstanding of pe that people have who are from the outside when they look into a community that in enjoy um, non-normative eroticism and queerness um is that they are not cozy uh, in, i mean i mean we talk about the criticisms of cozy but cozy uh, in that way in that people sometimes forget that erotic experiences are about human connection in some way and about human emotional connection right um so like uh i was at a bondage workshop this tuesday and i came out of it being like it was the first time i'd met with this particular community this workshop in in manhattan and I would came out being like, that was so lovely. Not that was so hot and arousing, but that was so lovely. Because we were all like chatting and like, oh, tying someone up. And we're, we have this like almost cozy moment where we're like connecting at a community level. We just happened to be doing bondage. We could have been, I don't know, sharing cupcakes, right? Uh, and I think people like forget that these things are all about human connection. I, uh, when when we, we were thinking about this before the panel, I was thinking about uh, an anthropy tiny little video game called Triad, which some of you might know, right? It's a game where you're, it's a puzzle game where you're trying to fit three people who are in a triad relationship, like in three sons and stuff, onto a bed, right? Like how do you, it's a puzzle. So how physical, like, like uh, Tetris style puzzle almost. Uh, where you're like, oh, can we fit these three people on the bed, right? And that game is so lovely to me. I mean, I don't like puzzle games in general, but that game is so lovely to me. That's also false. Sorry, I'm going off track. Uh, that game is so lovely to me because it depicts this, like, what one might be like, oh, ménage à trois, right? But 
the the game is like oh but these are three people just trying to live oh the bed is small how do we like fit these people into this bed together right um another example that i liked is in honey and hot wax the anthology that i co-edited with lucian uh Kat jones and will morningstar have a game called you inside us uh, with a two-player larp uh where one of you plays like a human astronaut kind of person one of you plays the alien parasite that infects them right um and that game asks us to question what is considered sensual and what is considered erotic right because we know that a lot of that is very culturally defined right like bare breasts in some cultures are considered highly erotic and some cultures are like that's what people do when they're working long hair in some culture considered people just have it in some cultures, like oh you shouldn't show people your long hair it's very erotic right um so uh you and Zayal asks us like what is erotic like uh, it's right, because it asks us, well, what does this alien inside you find erotic, right? It's not human. Is eating soup an erotic act for this alien because it has never felt this feeling before? And I think that game kind of explodes, like, what is wholesome versus what is erotic, right? Uh, it questions that because, like I said, my bondage workshop felt very wholesome, right? I was like, oh, my God, this was so lovely. Uh, if I tell some of my friends about it, they're like, oh yeah, sure. And I've told some other friends about it, they're like, and then they laugh because it's like funny to them that this idea of a bondage workshop can be wholesome, right? Um, and so I think the, the, the big thing about, um, about bringing together the erotic and the cozy is ideas of, well, the erotic is ultimately about human connection in specific ways but human connection and ultimately about finding community and communal ways of being and acting and experiencing joy i'm not going to say the word pleasure I, I mean i said the word pleasure but i'm not using the word pleasure because people associate with the word pleasure with like sleaziness but like joy because the erotic itself are about joy for like a lot of people right um including the people who like made the t-shirt as, as uh, uh, just mentioned right so i like as for me i like to like sometimes view it in like a really reductive context and so it's almost asking ourselves like the question like what does it mean to be cozy and like what does it mean to be erotic or kinky or whatnot and so like this like baseline one i just thought of is like i think like really high quality like fake fur is like really cozy and i think that like harnesses are like erotic and so like would like a harness made out of like velour fabric be both cozy and erotic like it's that kind of idea where it's like it, sometimes it just comes to this idea of like self-definition like like how do you how do you mix and match these things and then also like how do you perhaps choose your own experience but it's a really fascinating question <laughs> I love it that choose you an experience because we're about games, right? So. Absolutely. So thank you for these very rich answers. I think I think let's bring it back to sort of like hopes uh, and takeaways maybe that you have uh, for the jammers uh, who are going to be doing doing lots of creating this week. So, you know, uh, what do you hope people take away from, from the sorts of topics that we've discussed? What do you think would be really cool to see uh, in the jam? Are there any th things that you want to, to make sure that, uh, to highlight, I guess, uh, about your thoughts about queer magic, ritual, eroticism, coziness, uh, and, and so on? Uh, I think for me, um, I, I, <laughs> I will scream this from the rooftops. I love narrative games, especially when, you know, it's, you know, it speaks from the heart and like it speaks from personal experience. Uh, so kind of like when I, when I think about magic, I think about it in the context of using that term as sort of like a, like an energy to push yourself to be the best of your physical self. So when you push yourself to be, you know, your best version of yourself, you see change. And that really feels like magic to me. So I don't know, it, like it feels unreal. It feels good. Uh, Cause you like, you, you kind of took something you can't see. You took that energy and pulled it into existence and people see it. So it's like, 
there's 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 some there's some weird stuff going on with, with that. So like it, it's very interesting. So like if you know people want to go the route of creating like a narrative game about you know their personal experience going through uh you know transitioning or uh you know living you know like life experiences whether it be something positive or negative i think those are very very incredibly strong games that people really appreciate because they want to learn about other people's experience they want to learn about uh people who had the same experiences as them and like what did they do in that sort of situation and i think to speak on that it's very it's very powerful because that's kind of like what I did for for my first game when I, when I first started out. I made a game that was about, uh, you know, me experiencing something that was very new to me, and you know when I got to take that game to Indiecade and people played it and they were just like, "Is this game real? Is this like, <laughs> like yeah, like <laughs> it's like yeah, like yeah, like." Yeah, like you know, good things happen and bad things happen. And like these things could be like very real things. And like a lot of the times when I play these games by like smaller creators who make games that are so personal, uh, I have to like, you know, like step away from my computer and like think about it. And I feel like any game that makes you take a moment to think, to pause, to be like, whoa, or I felt that too. Oh, like I feel that. That that's that's some powerful stuff, and I I love to see that. So yeah. <laughs> I think in the I... jam. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Dizzy. In the jam context, I think it's so, especially in making games. I think it's so easy to think about: Will people like this? Like, will people have fun? And that's such a frustrating thing sometimes in being an artist and being a game designer, is because you like concoct all this stuff together and you're you know, you're mixing the pie, and then you kind of have your first plays, and you're like, I don't really know what this is, or I don't know how this makes me feel. And that's such a frustrating <laughs> iteration of being a game designer. And so, I, in kind of echoing what Rakashi is saying, is this like, I, I think that as you design your mechanics or your assets or whatnot, you really like, take, or your story, like take a step back every once in a while and ask yourself, like, is this me in a way? Like, like does this really capture like what I want to say, like what I want to say as a designer or an artist or whatnot. And this is truly that kind of space to really explore that. And so I would say focus less on the capitalistic angles for now, because this is the setting for it and focus more on the, on the, on the, how does this enrich me and what do I want to share with my audience? Uh, since our talk has been a lot about like symbols and things, I'm going to tell our jammers to keep this symbol in mind that I'm stealing from Izzy Iqbal, right? So keep the symbol of a fake fur harness in your mind, right? Because this fake fur harness, you can extrapolate to mean so many different things that will can serve as design inspiration. So first off, this is a non-normative like idea like wait what art harness is made of like leather and metal studs to be sexy but think of how this refers like bayonetta bayonetta uh, again what is he said uh, subverts and inverts what is considered good and bad so in this case this like fake fur thing is interesting uh, you can all think about how uh, oh do we can we put the the the, the fake fur harness is juxtaposing two things that a lot of people think are incompatible, right? Coziness and erotic. So think about that in your game design. Can you juxtapose things that other people might think of as incompatible um, and uh, put them together for your game, right? Uh, and then finally, um, if you go deep into this idea of a fake fur harness, there's lots of questions that arise that you can explore with your game, right? So we're using fake fur Think about the vegan vegan breath of the wild right like fake fur because it doesn't kill animals but what is fake fur made of petroleum petroleum extraction has a terrible toll on the environment is it better to actually use animals sustainably the way that many indigenous people do than that so so keep this idea of the fake fur harness in your mind and quote izzy iqbal because this image will allow you to draw a lot of different meanings from it. And if you make a game that actually uses a real fake for a harness, 
I declare you have won this game, Jack. Okay. <laughs> uh, some of some of what you've all brought up, uh, I want to bring back an idea uh, from our previous panel, which is this uh, idea that uh, your queerness is allowed to be messy, and that like you know queer messiness is also like part of the queer experience. That like you know there there is like you know a potential uh, values contradiction uh, in the choices that that we make uh, as people, uh, and there's there's like a richness uh, there too. Um, and room, room, room for things to be imperfect, messy, unfinished, unpolished, uh, and, and all those sorts of things. Um, so I want to take the time uh, to thank all of you for this amazing journey uh, of a conversation. Uh, feels like we've we've been through so many amazing uh, topics. Uh, I'm aware that like we have created a meme. Uh, you know, with our our uh, frog uh, warm up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Don't forget the juice. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, uh, it's been such a pleasure to to speak with you all, uh, to put you all in conversation, uh, to see what you have to say to each other, uh, and to the folks listening. Uh, you know, it's it's just such a joy. I like can't believe that I like got up today and got to listen to so many amazing people like talk. And then like poke them about the things that I wanted to hear about. That's so cool. Uh, for for our jammers, uh, I wanted to remind you that if you join our Discord server, uh, it may be a little bit easier uh, to to figure out like-minded folks uh, than on the itchio itchio uh, you know chat boards. Uh, there's probably going to be a fair bit more uh, like active conversation and support uh, on the Discord. Though of course it's your choice. Uh, how you want to jam and 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 all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. And I just want to throw it over to Kaylin uh, in case they have anything they want to add. Yes, absolutely. Definitely join the Discord. Um, also note that you know if you watch this symposium and you have no idea what anybody said, or if your like mind is still processing what's going on, I want to say you are not alone. Like everybody, including probably Jess and I and all of the panelists, are also still digesting everything that was said. Uh, we are going to be sharing notes um, in the next couple of days that highlight some sort of key ideas. There's like a kind of grassroots project that's in the early stages in the Discord right now to make a simple language version or like simple language notes version of the two panels um, so that you can sort of parse through that. Uh, also, this is recorded, so it will be uh, the VOD will be available if you want to rewatch it on your own time. You are also welcome to sort of take like snippets, like if you want to take the 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 fake fur harness, if you want to take um, somebody, I think Rokashi, when you mentioned Jigglypuff, it got mistranslated in the auto caption as Jiggly Father. <laughs> um, oh my God. And I think if somebody father. wants to make a game about Jiggly Father, like please. I would love that. Um, now we're into yeah. queer glitch Jiggly territory. Father. Yeah, Jiggly oh Father God. is absolutely queer. Please. We like we 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 own Jiggly Father. Um, he's one of us. Uh, um, anyways, uh, some next steps as well. Um, our other sponsor for this event is the Center for Digital Humanities at Toronto Metropolitan University, and. On October 17th, I believe, they will be running an online intro to Bitsy workshop. So if you've never made a game before, if you want to learn Bitsy, it's like a very small, very easy to learn intuitive game engine. Great for making your first game. They're running a workshop. Anybody who feels like they want to run any kind of like Skillshare or workshop is welcome to just start that up in the Discord. I think that's a great way to get involved in game jams. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, take your time. You don't feel like you have to like have an idea right now and rush to the team building channel to like write down your idea. Feel free to join a team based only on your sort of shared goals and then to, to talk about the theme itself and what you actually want to make like a little later down the road. Um, like your own enjoyment of this experience is our first priority. Um, and yes, please send Rokashi your Jiggly Father games if you indeed make 
<laughs> make for them. Uh, um, but it's the best auto caption moment I've like ever experienced. Oh my goodness. We've already we do already have Jiggly Father fan art in the Discord. I will say that. Oh There's my god! To, to join it. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, These panels have been really fantastic. I'm so excited to see what people make. Um, and you will see us in video form uh, at our closing session, which is on October 28th. Uh, otherwise, happy jamming, happy playing, uh, and I will see you all in Discord. Thanks, everybody.